Are we ready or? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Councilor Richie Torres. I am the chair of the Committee on Public Housing. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to dispense with an opening statement, but the subject of today's hearing is tenant participation activity funds. I know Councilor Salamanca, I don't know if you have a few words to share. Or yeah. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Chair Richie Torres uh, for calling this hearing today and what I believe has been a very convoluted and um, burdensome process surrounding the Tenant Participation Activity Fund for our NYCHA developments. I'm incredibly frustrated surrounding the rollout of recently proposed changes regarding our TPA funds. And if I'm frustrated, I can only imagine how frustrated or in some instances afraid our NYCHA tenants and tenants association leaders are in thinking that they may be losing much needed and much deserved TPA funds. And I'm frustrated for a number of reasons. First, it was totally shocked I was totally shocked to get calls from not just one tenant association leader, but many, regarding the new agreement that they were being asked to sign without fully understanding what it was. That led to great confusion, fear, and worry that signing meant developments would no longer have their own control over TPA funds, and that is unacceptable. Secondly, on top of this, council members were not briefed either on proposed changes to the TPA fundings, which of course is problematic for a number of reasons. And third, when we did finally receive a briefing on these changes after requesting a meeting, we learned that when TPA funds come down from the federal government, 40% of the gross funding that is able to be utilized by NYCHA for administrative costs is in fact taken, but is spent on just two or three employees, despite the funding set aside being in the millions. So while those are just three of the overreaching big concerns I have today, I look forward to getting more in the weeds on the hearing process. Before I turn it back to the chair, um, I do want to take a minute to say thank you to all the NYCHA residents and particularly the tenant association leaders that are here today, notably from the Bronx and District 17. And as you know, Mr. Chair, much of the work that we try to do to serve our NYCHA residents cannot be done without the support of our tenant associations. And I'm thankful to have strong tenant associations and tenant association leaders who share love for the Bronx and its people and want to help move the community forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca, and thank you for being the inspiration behind the hearing and hearing the outcry of the tenant leaders. Uh, in keeping with the tradition of the Public Housing Committee, we're going to start with four tenant leaders and then proceed with the New York City Housing Authority. So I would like to call up the first panel, uh, Ms. Lily Lozano from Bronx District Council, uh, Ms. Charlene Nimitz, uh, Daniel Barber, and uh, Lisa Kenner. Okay. If you have a copy of your testimony or, yes. Can we have a two-minute timer? Ms. Lozano, let me know when you're ready to begin.
Good morning. I'm elated over having the opportunity to uh, discuss the issues at hand. I've been a resident leader since 1998, became the CCOP treasurer for the Citywide Council of Presidents. I've asked NYCHA for the last three years, it's my second term, that I wanted to get an allocate, I wanted to get a list of allocations for all the developments throughout the city of expenditures. I was informed that they didn't have records from 2001 to 2013. I find that disconcerting. So what you have before you is what I've got access to. Let me just tell you that many years ago, in 1993, January 12th, we had a memorandum of understanding under the Citywide Council of Presidents, which it expired through three terminate, I mean, three, uh, three organizations in the Citywide Council of Presidents. What happened? They ignored it. We needed to have a contractual agreement with NYCHA. So then this way, we would be decision makers and policy makers when it came to the decisions, when it came to HUD. Well, to our dismay, what you have, what I have in close is that CCAP did have an account that you have in, in your possession. I also have the bank account <coughs> statements with interest that we discussed with NYCHA through our closed door dialogue, which wasn't many of them. They claimed that they gave us several, um, they made several attempts to discuss with us what the changes were gonna be. But that never happened. They just did surveys arbitrarily in our districts, and we were the afterthought. When we decided to ask them to give us surveys of what was entailed in getting this TPA um, reform, they once said that they couldn't give it to us. So what I'm handing you to now is a confidential draft of, of the monies. I have the allocations throughout the city of New York from 2003 to 2011 of the allocations for every district around the city. Why do I have access to it and NYCHA doesn't? The other thing is a original uh, memorandum of um, agreement that we need to renegotiate with NYCHA. We're in the midst of re re uh, redoing it um, this Thursday to sign one. And we want NYCHA to meet with us because we cannot sit in the hell of the room and be ignored and be called that we're dysfunctional. And this is why they're not addressing us. So, Can you please conclude? Yes. So what I conclude is, is that one, um, after seeking, seeking legal counsel, um, we found out that um, the interpretation of the TPA is vague, is problematic according to the attorneys. And what we are requesting is that they need to terminate that. And to say that somebody signs under protest and nil and void them for getting monies for their developments is deplorable and is prejudicial and is discriminatory. So with all that being said, the material that I've provided you should speak on its own reconnaissance. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Charlene Nimmons. I'm a resident at White Grove Gardens, but I'm formerly the resident association president for over 12 years. When I was the president, in the last two years of my time that I was there, I was told that I did not have any more funding under TPA, and we wanted to do some additional training. And then when a new president came in, ooh, they found money. So how is it that, and I'm okay, I'm glad they found money. They found our money. However, that means you were not keeping an accurate record if you didn't know that we still had funding. So people got, um, could not get trained because NYCHA did not have their budget together. That 40% of those dollars is outrageous. When now, you, you used to be able to get technical assistance, right? Or that was what NYCHA is supposed to be, technical advisors. They get this money, and now we're told we have to do our own TPA proposals. We have to do, if we want admins, we have to hire admins. Um, it, at one time, the TPA proposals was done in, con in conjunction with the association and NYCHA. Then they shifted everything, all responsibility, onto the resident association. 
I'm going to go forward into where I got involved and I was asked to review the TPA agreement. You have a list of the issues that a number of resident leaders looked over to see what, what those concerns were. The one that really stands out is the funding that if you don't use the funding before the year ends, it rolls over into NYCHA and then NYCHA gets to decide where that money goes and how it's spent. When those dollars, the resident associations need those funding uh, allocations because that's most of the time the only funding that they have to operate their organization. So to say that you're going to roll it over and then it's going to go into NYCHA's budget is unfair to the residents of that particular house. So I just ask that this all be reconsidered, come back to the drawing board. Under the HUD regulations, there is supposed to be conversations with the leaders and not decisions <coughs> made without them. The HUD regulations say that they're supposed to be a part of policy making and so forth. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Ms. Kenner? Good morning. My name is Lisa Kenner. See, I'm, so, I'm not used to wearing glasses, and when you get a certain age, you got to start wearing glasses. Um, i got to get adjusted. What age is that? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're not there yet, okay. so don't worry about it. I just want to make sure. Right, you're not there. But I wanted to say good morning. My name is Lisa Kenner. I'm a resident of Van Dyke Houses for 58 years and a resident association president for 13 so I've told my age. <laughs> I sit before you because of the TPA MOU agreement that NYCHA want us to sign. I am not a lawyer, so some of the language I do not understand. However, I do understand signing this agreement may come back to haunt me down the road. You see, I asked, I asked for the budget for um, Brooklyn East Council of President and was denied by NYCHA and the Brooklyn East chairperson. Now, if I can't get a, a budget count for the Brooklyn East, how can I get a count for mine? Like I tell them, I don't have time to be going to Bedford Hills. I'm not sitting in Bedford Hills for anyone. Um, <coughs> but one thing about the TPA that I want to say is 20% was going to Brooklyn East, and you couldn't even get a budget. You couldn't get a count of how much money was being spent. Uh, I've been going over this for years and years. Like I said, I've been the president for 2003. So I came in near the early part when they was let the allocating, but they wouldn't let you spend it. But you have to write a proposal. So anything that you spend, you have to submit the proposal and your receipts. Um, so however, we want to use the money for the uplift of the residents. Um, that's what I do, and I know that's what every other president do because that's what the money's um, allocated for. But it's so hard to get it if it takes 90 days and it is this days and that days and you're trying to do a, a workshop to enhance everybody's life, not just the, the executive board, but the residents as a whole that live in your development. Now, I want to say this. I know I can do a manager job. I probably could do the chair job. But they think that we all incompetent. And a lot of people here got more common sense than you ever know. You know, you don't have to have a degree. You know, you just got to have common sense. I know I can run my development. You know, but you know, that's why some of them are scared because they know we can run our development. We went to New Orleans. I seen people run their development. That place was immaculate. You imagine we could run out development and we know every resident in there. You think dog feces would be on the ground? You think garbage would be on the ground? You know, this is what the thing to me about the TPA fund is to educate our people so they can run their own development. Instead of selling it. Mm. Right, Mr. Barber. So. so I guess we'll expect your application for the chairmanship of the housing authority. Okay. <laughs> wow. Just know those positions, senior positions are available under section three. But excuse me, I, I just want respect to the chair. I give her respect. She's a good woman. She knows her stuff. But I just know that we can run it. 
Mr. Barber. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Barber, and I am the president of the Andrew Jackson Houses Resident Association. First and foremost, I want to thank Mr. Torres and my council member, Rafael Salamanca, Jr., for reaching out to the chair to hold this this hearing that we're presently at today. I appreciate the compassion and consideration you took to move forward and the hardships to get to this date. So I want you to know that they, they all go noted, and I thank you so much. Okay, um, I wrote a testimony, but I'm going to defer from that because these guys here touched the majority of it, so you guys can look at it later. But just basically, we're here because there's no accountability. We've been begging for training and things to lead the training. We have resident leadership that come into the positions, and a lot of the people don't understand. They don't know. Um, we're forcing seniors to sign an agreement that an, an attorney that I took the agreement to, he had problems digesting the agreement from the Bronx Defenders. He had problems digesting the agreement when he looked at it. So if an attorney who goes to school to study contracts and negotiations can't understand the beginning parameters of this agreement, how can we expect a 72-year-old senior who does this to keep her or him alive because they have nothing else to do? We have to start being mindful to all of the residents. Under 24 CFR HUD 964 regulations, it states that we're supposed to have an agreement in order to receive monies. I'm not going to lie to you guys and tell you anything different. I'll be finished in one second. But what it does state is on a local council level. We can do agreement on a local level, and I know that it would cause a, a, a chaos to NYCHA to go into 300 separate local agreements. But if that's what the regulations state, then that's what the regulations state. NYCHA takes the regs, turns the regs to be interpreted for what their interpretation is, but we get no training, we get no notifications when things are going to change. We find out when we submit paperwork and it's rejected. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by the Majority Leader, Jimmy Van Bramer, and I don't know if my colleagues have any questions. So just, just for some clarity here, uh, when they presented this, uh, when NYCHA presented this uh, TPA agreement, was there training provided uh, to you? NYCHA held, um, NYCHA did it first, NYCHA did a training in Brooklyn. Um, there was a lot of complaint from myself and Mr. Cheney Elverton, Morris Senior Air Rights, about why do people have to go outside of their borough. If you're going to do one training, you might as well do it in every borough. Ms. Janelle Hudson sent us an email and told us that there were going to be two trainings in the Bronx, one at Sotomayor, and the other one would be at um, the Classic Center. We went in, and the training, although what NYCHA called a training, it was more of a lecture because when questions were asked, we were told that, we're not going to go to the past. We can't go back to the past, and we won't go to the past. But in order to get to the present, you have to talk about the past. Well, let me just touch you on that because he's from the Bronx and I'm from Brooklyn. Um, Mr. Cave, Ryan Cave, came and trained us at Van Dyke Center. And, and then now during each month, it's a cluster meeting. And we, um, that's what Jacqueline Howard and stuff, and you learn it. But my thing was, you teaching us, but there's no lawyer in the house that you can ask. Because the first three lines, I said, oh, no, I don't know this. I'm not signing my, I'm not signing my name, you know. Um, they didn't have a lawyer for us, for the, re the, the residents. They had a lawyer for themselves, but they didn't have one for ourselves. And you don't know all that language and that terminology and all this sort of stuff. You know, so it wasn't fair. I just, 
the other thing was that what was so disturbing is that I anonymously received an email stating that because I signed that agreement and I placed under protest that my proposal was null and void. I would have not known had I not put in a proposal to plan something for my executive board. I mean, that's, that's uncalled for. I mean, in these cluster meetings, they're not really assisting in any type of capacity. And I tell you that because they pretty much have left the districts pretty much bankrupt. We have to go before our resident leaders. Some of them don't have training. We have provided, I know in my district, I've provided training to my leadership. And I've lost big developments behind it because they are perturbed over giving, giving the district 20% but then NYCHA is having everybody else do the work for 40%. The math doesn't add up. Why, why, why do that? If we, we sub, That's why that memorandum of understanding, we need to revisit that because as the city-wide council of presidents, we have a responsibility to be this, the, 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 you know, the people to speak on behalf of every resident throughout the city, and we're being disregarded. So to just arbitrarily put cluster meetings and say that works, it does not work, Chair, at all. It doesn't work. And you know what? For someone to face prejudice, and I have to get an anonymous email telling me that if I don't take under protest, I'm not going to be able to get funding for my development. That, that's really disheartening. To say that they have a partnership with us, I don't think so at all. And that's all I have to say. Let me just say something. Let me just say, because I have to say this before. <clears throat> now, they say they don't have any money. If they start renting the community centers back, and a lot of people don't have no place to go, to have, rather they be a baby shower. Yeah, with respect, that's off topic. So okay, let's I'm just sorry, further. but that's you. important. I just want to, the majority leader has a question or comment. Go ahead. I think thank you very much, uh, Chair. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the Chair for having this important uh, hearing. I have the great honor and privilege of representing the Queensbridge Houses, the Ravenswood Houses, and the Woodside Houses in Queens. And I just want to recognize in the audience uh, Mrs. Annie Cotton Morris, who is the head of our uh, Woodside Houses Tenant Association, but also the Queens Council. Uh, uh, she's a great leader in, in our community, in our city, and uh, I know I'll be listening to uh, Ms. Cotton Morris on this topic, but I'm really uh, uh, alarmed by the testimony and, and by the issues that are raised, and, and I can assure you that Ms. Cotton Morris and uh, Ms. April Simpson-Taylor and uh, Ms. Carol Wilkins will be working on this together uh, to protect uh, certainly my TAs and RAs and all of them. So I just want to thank the chair again for the opportunity. So can I just respond to the question as far as the training? Sure. So when you talk about training, I actually was brought in by one of the resident associations as their admin. So I came to the meeting that was done in Manhattan. And again, it's a lecturer. They lecture you. Um, the problem is when you talk about training, how can you train someone that most time have more information than you do? So a lot of times the New York City Housing Authority staff is shifted around from location to location. No offense. I, I love a lot of them, right, because I get the opportunity to work with them. But most of the time they have no clue on what those HUD regulations mean and how they apply to the associations. When I can come into a room and spot errors on documents, and then I inform you of it, then you kind of like push it to the side, oh, we're just working through it. It is the beginning of a process. You all, city council, allocated funding for, for tra leadership training. You can't tell the housing authority to train us when we're training them. And we are not being invited to the table. I had a conversation. I'm told that I'm going to be talking further. But they're going to hire someone to train us that's not associated with the resident associations. I'm not going to call out who asked me to come to the table before the funding was even allocated. But we were told now I cannot be there as a training provider because I'm not a NYCHA resident association president anymore. So I, w I want to understand the, the takeaway for me is I've heard three objections. One is there's no sufficient accounting of the TPA fundings for each development. Is that second, the agreement, in your opinion, even those who concede that there should be agreement pursuant to regulations, 
is too legalistic, too complicated. Most resident leaders have no legal representation or attorney. And then the third was engagement. Uh, do you, even though you disagree with NYCHA's reforms, do you agree that the process does require reform, or do you think it functions well as is? Sometimes reform just means just break it and start over because you can't reform something that's not reformable. I couldn't think you of the word. <laughs> well, do you believe the process is broken and needs to be fixed, or do you think it's fine as is? There's a lot of problems that need to be fixed. I think that one of the one we need to be looking at the HUD regulations. It says that a resident association is supposed to be a part of the dialogue from inception. It's not, it, it, it's, it's about from the time you have a thought, you should be calling the resident associations to the table, not when you have your blueprint and all the dialogues and everything together, your presentations, your PowerPoints, you, you need to have a conversation with the leadership to talk about what this should look like and what it should be, not dictating. It's a dictatorship. And, and for them to di disengage with the citywide council of presidents, when we, we've elected by, by our, our leadership to— Can you speak to, to, on the mic? To, I mean, to, to be disregarded as a citywide—that's why it's crucial, Chair, and I'm—, I'm I'm passionately saying this. I can't, I can't get any more passionate. They, um, the NYCHA needs to sit down with CCOP and, and take notice that we all are going to have a memorandum of agreement. And it shouldn't go to fit the bureaucracy of the law department because they want to prolong the inevitable. They need to sit. We, we are part of the 964, and we, we continue to be ignored and disregarded and even though they say they have dialogue it's minimal dialogue and it is i agree with my colleague it is a dictatorship okay. if it's not broke don't fix it okay. it's, it's broke but, it's but let me just say just this. a final comment i understand she said to sit down with c cop but then c cop wasn't making sure that all the districts was getting the budget okay because i'm talking about brooklyn east we didn't see a budget in god knows how long from Mr. I won't say his name, everybody know, but um, we didn't see it. So you talk about CCOP, CCOP's supposed to have been making sure that the districts were doing the right thing, okay? Thank you for your testimony, thank you. The next panel will consist of the New York City Housing Authority. We have Sadia Sherman, the Executive Vice President, and Janelle Hudson. Can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? You may proceed. Okay. okay. Can everyone hear me? Chair Richie Torres. Members of the Committee on Public Housing and other distinguished members of the City Council, good morning. I am Sadia Sherman, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnerships. Joining me today is Janelle Hudson, Director of Resident Engagement Department. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss our work to empower residents and to strengthen communities by improving the tenant participation activity process. Through Next Generation NYCHA, our long-term our long strategic plan, the authority is becoming a more efficient and effective landlord. One of the core pillars driving NYCHA's transformation is our work to engage residents in new and better ways and to connect them to best-in-class services. Under Chair Olatoye's leadership, the departments under my purview have tirelessly, have worked tirelessly to reset NYCHA's relationships with residents, transition from direct service to from direct service delivery to a partnership-based model, and connect residents to quality economic opportunity. 
With a number of new reforms and new initiatives that empower residents and resident associations, including a revamp of the outdated and cumbersome TPA funding process, NYCHA is becoming a smarter 21st century landlord. In addition to empowering residents and resident leadership, we are strengthening NYCHA's relationship with them. For instance, as part of Next Generation NYCHA, we established monthly cluster meetings last year to provide resident association members with updates on important and relevant topics. We've begun offering leadership training and development as part of our cluster meetings so resident association members can become more effective and a effective advocates for their community. To give youth a voice and a role in tackling the community's most pressing issues, we launched 10 youth leadership councils in partnership with NYC Service and Capital One. Our latest youth summit was just two weeks ago. More than 130 young people attended, and it highlighted the good work the councils are already doing, leading their neighborhoods in cleanup days, addressing community safety, and attracting new resources for these projects. As part of our work to transform the way NYCHA does business, we committed to reforming the TPA process with the goal of strengthening resident associations by fostering their leadership and independence. I'll discuss details about the new process later in my testimony. We are also updating the resident association election process to make it more consistent and transparent and to encourage more developments to participate. Thanks to the support of the City Council, we will launch a resident leadership training academy in partnership with CUNY, continuing our work to build stronger, more independent resident associations. For the first time in NYCHA's history, we'll offer coursework that enables residents to earn college credits while gaining valuable leadership skills. The TPA funding process was broken. It was, dishearten it was disheartening and it involved layers of bureaucracy. To fix it, we gathered input from residents on what, we want, what they wanted in a new process, made improvements per this feedback, and launched the new process initially as a pilot, which involved training for all stakeholders. Our engagement process started early, and we took the time necessary to involve all stakeholders. It kicked off in November 2015 with a meeting between Chair Olatoye and the Citywide Council of Presidents. After a series of district meetings, more than 100 resident associations, including the CCOP and district board members, provided feedback across 11 focus groups, which we, which we presented back in a series of five meetings. We then coordinated with HUD, NYCHA's procurement and law departments, and many others to put in place the changes resident wanted, residents wanted. Our outreach on the new process involved briefing the CCOP, as well as the council's members of the Bronx delegation, including Chair Torres, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and representatives from the offices of Controller Scott Stringer, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, and Speaker Mark, Mark Viverito. We also conducted two webinars on the topic with a total of 70 elected official representatives and advocates, and we briefed the Legal Aid Society and the Community Service Society. We received positive feedback at many of these meetings. We formally introduced the new process to resident leadership through multiple workshops with HUD, our partner and regulator, and provided RAs the option to opt in to a TPA pilot that is the basis for the new program. In 17 citywide and borough level trainings, as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, residents learned more about the new process, including the related funding agreement, forms, and spending plans, and received the new guidebook. In total, we held more than 40 meetings, workshops, focus groups, and training, centers, training sessions to improve the TPA process. Resident feedback is the foundation for our reform of the TPA process. Residents told us they wanted more visibility of the funds, the choice to fund district councils, more local control over spending, and faster processing and purchasing ability. Change is hard, which is why we work so hard to engage stakeholders on this new process. And we realize that there's a small but vocal group which is dissatisfied with some of the changes. But we believe the improvements are in line with industry standards and are equitable and sustainable. NYCHA staff is assisting with the transition to the process. Let me give you some background on TPA funds. They come from our federal operating funds. 
HUD requires public housing authorities to allocate $25 per dwelling unit, of which 15 or 60% is for the resident association and 10 or 40% is for the housing authority to fund a range of resident association and resident engagement matters, including tenant participation activities. TPA funds are reduced when our operating funding is reduced through proration. Last year, for instance, there were only able to allocate about $11 per unit instead of 15. NYCHA has not been fully funded in over a decade, including for its TPA funding. It should be noted that the funding NYCHA receives does not fully cover the cost of all work related to engaging residents, procurement, and supporting resident, uh, resident leadership, including resident association elections. Before, TPA funds were complicated to access and difficult to use. The process was unwieldy and disorganized, with NYCHA even acting as a travel agent in some cases. By decentralizing control of the funds and instituting a commercial credit card to access them, the new process is smart, efficient, transparent, and promotes accountability. Transparency. Previously, TPA funds were allocated by district and individual RAs did not have full visibility on spending. Now the funds are allocated and tracked at the development level, and NYCHA will inform each RA of funding availability annually. Residents said they wanted a choice on whether to fund their districts, and now they, have, now they can decide to do so if they want. Efficiency. Before, residents had to rely on NYCHA for all procurements. Residents wanted more, more flexibility, and now they can use a commercial card to make approved purchases up to $5,000. So a resident association can get office supplies at the nearest Staples without having to order them through NYCHA's procurement department, which is set up to handle the needs of a $3 billion organization, meaning that it could take 30 days to get these simple supplies. Currently, 33 resident associations are piloting the use of the commercial card, and our goal is to have 80% of the RAs using it by next year. To speed the process, we have also instituted faster turnarounds, five business days for reviewing funding proposals. While unspent funds could be rolled over in the past, we believe that these funds, which benefit residents and communities, are more important than ever and should be spent within the year, like council funding. Accountability. Previously, this was a paper-driven process. As part of the next-gen transformation to digital, we moved it online and are using IT systems to track spending proposals and reconciliation. In addition, we established clear guidelines for both NYCHA staff and the RAs for administering and accessing funds, issued a new guidebook, updated relevant, relevant forms, and trained RAs as well as NYCHA staff on the new process. Accountability is important. Our new agreement on the use of TPA funds protects residents as much as it protects the funds, outlining the responsibilities of both NYCHA and the RA. For instance, the RA agrees to have timely elections and engage in activities that improve residents' quality of life, while NYCHA agrees to officially recognize the RA and administer the funding accordingly. Many of the challenges RAs experienced in the old process were due to lack of written clarity between NYCHA and the RA. The funding agreement, which is accompanied by a plain language guidebook, outlines when and how funding becomes available, what forms are required of the RA, how payment is issued to vendors, and the terms for reporting and resolving disputes. The RA also agrees to comply with HUD and NYCHA guidelines, including conflicts of interest rules. Not only is a written agreement required by HUD for every public housing authority, but it's typical for any financial transaction, from renting an apartment to buying a cell phone, as well as any disbursement of funds from a government, from a government body. The previous, previous agreement was between the CCOP and NYCHA. It is now between the RAs and NYCHA. In preparing our agreement, we learned from other public housing authorities, looking at sample contracts and guidebooks from Boston and Chicago. RAs had approximately 90 days to review the agreement and also had an opportunity to seek independent legal advice if they desired. During this process, RAs still had access to the funds. 113 RAs have signed the agreement. Nonetheless, we're responding to feedback from residents and valuable input recently received from the Legal Aid Society and Brooklyn Legal Services to sim simplify the agreement's language. We're providing revised draft to Legal Aid this week. 
RA signed an agreement with NYCHA submitting a spending plan and uh, submitting a spending plan and keep proper financial records all in accordance with HUD guidelines. HUD states that only a duly elected resident council can receive TPA funds. HUD also defines the eligible participants, beneficiaries, and acti activities and stipulates that RAs complete training similar to the 17 sessions we held earlier this year with resident leadership. We focused on reforming RAs el elections as part of NextGen so that more developments can become eligible to receive these vital funds. Some examples of elig eligible tenant participation activities include RA membership building, information dissemination, health fairs, development cleanup days, and educational classes and workshops. RAs must still submit annual spending plans and follow procurement rules. What's different now is that they submit their proposals for these funds quarterly instead of prior to every activity, which speeds up the access to the funds. As I mentioned, RAs can use their commercial credit card for approved purchases under 5000 and then reconcile their spending via our online system. This will also streamline the process. Purchases over $5,000 will still go through NYCHA's procurement process, which is what residents requested due to their concerns over making larger payments. This also ensures compliance with HUD procurement guidelines. The commercial card can also be used for approved travel which involves the same checks and balances in place for a NYCHA employee traveling for official business. As with smaller purchases, use of the commercial card makes arrangements easier and faster. NYCHA's success depends in part on our collaboration with residents. TPA funds are a crucial way to engage residents, keep them informed, and include them in the conversation on how to address the authority's challenges. As they become more effective leaders through tenant participation activities, Residents will help improve the quality of life at their developments in their community at large. In our work to engage more than 250 resident associations citywide, we have seen the positive impact of this partnership. As our next-gen NYCHA vision continues to be brought to life, we will endeavor to get more residents involved in making a difference in their communities through easier access and use of TPA funds. With residents by our side, we will continue to create the safe, clean, and connected communities that all New Yorkers deserve. Thank you. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to start with um, uh, Councilmember Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a few questions regarding your, uh, um, your administrative staff. How many uh, staff members do you have that uh, deal with the TPA? Sure. Currently, the TPA unit consists of 10 staff, and um, that's really staff that has been managing the process all along. Through this reform, we have um, added additional support in the resident engagement uh, lead coordinators, and they're managing the new the, the tenant associations who are using the new process. All right. So... You know, we had a meeting with Brian not too long ago uh, to get an update to find out exactly what's happening. And he mentioned, uh, and if, I, if I'm mistaken, Mr. Chair, that you had three staff members mm -hmm. that were dealing with uh, TPA funds. So to Janelle's point, there, there are 10 staff within our resident engagement department. There's also additional staff time within our budget department. Um, our costs related to administering TPA exceed what is available through TPA funding. Um, I would also add that the TPA funds, if you read the regulations, they not only apply to administering TPA, they also apply to a lot of the requirements that PHAs have under 964. So administering elections, um, resolving election disputes, et cetera, those are charges that NYCHA right now absorbs. So the core team is 10 within resident engagement, okay. um, and then there are part-time, full-time equivalent staff within our budget department. So your administrative, so the, the administrative fees that you take from the TPA funds are used to cover your, ex your, your overhead costs for the residential engagement um, department? So partially, right? So they cover, they don't fully cover the cost of, of the staff time that we commit to tenant participation activities. We've also used our administrative fee to cover costs related with NYCHA's resident advisory board. So this is a board of resident association presidents. Um, NYCHA for many years as a matter of practice um, has used those funds to provide stipends and meals and transportation for our resident advisory uh, board process and has sort of taken that out of our administrative fee. 
2016, uh, what was your administrative fee in total that you uh, that NYCHA took out of the TPA fund? Sure. So it's 40%. In 2015, there was approximately $1.5 million available in administrative dollars. Our staff time was one8 Okay. Is there a way that we can get a, a um, for this committee can get a detailed um, Excel sheet in terms of the last uh, couple of years? What was the administrative fee that NYCHA took out of the TPA funds? It's a standard forty percent of the allocation. So we but they vary, right? Because you said that it depends on what HUD exactly. allocates. So in sure. certain years it could be higher than others. Sure. So when we so when we adopt our budget, which is available online, it it does include. Uh, all of NYCHA's operating funds and what that and the paration rate and so it would be the percentage of that. So we would it's what's available through our adopted budget. So we can certainly share that. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, the agreements when they were given, so I represent the Bronx. You know, I have the third hi- highest NYCHA portfolio in the city of New York, um, and um, and the concerns that I got from my tenant uh, leaders or the tenant presidents, the fact that they did not understand these agreements. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that that message, that they they, that that message was clear to you because I was part of the emails, and you and, and you were also part of the emails. What is NYCHA doing uh, to uh, to come back and sit down with the tenant leaders, at least by borough, to explain to them how these agreements actually work, and to really dissect these agreements uh, with them? Sure. So we, as, as we discussed, we had a number of workshops and training that also included an explanation of the agreement, and we spent some time going back and forth and giving more information to residents, particularly in your district. We provided written responses to every question that the, your district members had, but we also realized that resident associations needed le- independent legal advice, which is fair. And so we're pleased that we had some feedback from Legal Aid Society, um, from, the, from the residents who reached out to them. Um, which includes, I'm sure, some residents in your district. We also have feedback from Brooklyn Legal Services. Um, We have taken that feedback and updated the agreement so that it reflects what we're hearing from residents. So in terms of substance, uh, much of the substance is the same, so the agreement still sets the terms between NYCHA and the Housing Authority. Um, In terms of style and language, we've simplified the the language so that um, it's easier for people to understand and to execute, um, and we've made sure that it's more streamlined. And so we hope to, we're sending uh, updated version of that agreement to legal aid this week, um, and then we would hope to have something to share again with the resident leaders that meets their satisfaction. So you have, so you're working on a new agreement now. We're updating. You're updating your agreement. Exactly. So what happens to the agreements that were signed? Are they null and void? So we want one set of agreements with everyone. So we would go back to the TA presidents who've signed. As I mentioned, in terms of substance, it's still the same requirements, um, but we're making sure that everyone has the same agreement. So okay. we should be able to circulate something soon right. um, that has a simplified When language. was the deadline to sign the agreements? The original? May 1st. May 1st. So my understanding is that after May 1st, they did not have access to their funds unless that agreement was signed. So after May 1st, we were no longer approving okay. So now you're updating the agreement. So mm-hmm. do they have access to their funds since the, you're updating your agreement and you have not submitted a new agreement? So, so as we, we will get a new agreement out immediately, and so as I mentioned, we're sending one out next week. Um, we've already started to receive proposals from resident associations that do not have agreements, and we would be prepared to move forward and approve those once we have the agreement. Um, you should note that many of the resident associations have had access to their funds during this transition process. We, between January and May, they had access to their funds to submit proposals. Many submitted proposals for things that were planned months ahead with the anticipation of having a pause in May. And so as soon as we get that agreement back out to them, we would move forward and release those any, any additional funds for proposals thereafter. If they propose something before May that is planned for the out months, they've already received those. Uh, what about those residents, uh, the TA presidents that are using these um, these funds to, to, to pay for costs that they're inquiring in their, in their offices, their, their local offices, such as internet, fax machine, cable? Uh, what happens there? So if you have an ongoing service and did not sign an agreement, um, there's been 30 days potentially where that, that a payment hasn't been made. Um, I think in no instance we've had an, in, it, there have been, to my knowledge, no instances where sh- services have been shut off as a result of not having agreement. Okay. Um, also, at least uh, in my council districts, I've allocated uh, discretionary funding mm-hmm. for my TA my TA uh, uh, our presidents for their family days, mm-hmm. about five thousand dollars each. I want to make I want to make sure that that has nothing to do with that's not going to affect in terms of if they have not signed these agreements, they will have access to that that money that I 
that I allocated to my TA presidents. These are completely separate processes. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I apologize, council members are in and out because we have conflicting votes in hearing, so we might have to step out at some point. Um, okay, so, so do, you, do you regard the package of reforms that you've put forward as, as comprehensive? Like, how would you? So, yeah, so I think this is a pretty comprehensive set of reforms. Um, you know, in terms of, so a lot of what we've heard as major concerns were lack of visibility on their development level budgets, and we agree, you know, this was something that was tracked at the district level, it's now tracked at the development level. Um, we heard concerns about uh, the ease of spending, and so using NYCHA's procurement channels for everyday purchases, we've changed that with the commercial card. Um, and then in terms of capacity building and technical assistance, I think that this is pretty comprehensive. This is the first time that we've ever uh, rolled out a, a, a process with this amount of training, where we've assigned people with one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I think we are working with resident associations as we move through the process, but this has certainly been uh, the most comprehensive reform that NYCHA has ever taken with respect to TPA. And I share NYCHA's goal of promoting greater transparency around uh, TPA funds, but it strikes me that your comprehensive package has a few glaring omissions. And one of them is there seems to be no plan for reducing the administrative overhead. Mm -hmm of 40%. Uh, I'm not aware of a government program that has a 40% overhead. I think the notion of a 40% overhead would suggest an inefficiently run mm -hmm. program. So why is there no plan for curbing administrative overhead? I think the second observation I would make is there seems to be no strategy for building resident councils. And without a resident council, there's no means of accessing TPA funds, and as you know, I believe as many as a third of NYCHA developments are without resident councils. Mm -hmm. And I think the third is related to the second, which is this huge pot of unspent TPA funds. What's the strategy for actually spending, what, mm -hmm. 10 to 15 million dollars of unspent TPA funds? So uh, those are the three glaring omissions that I identify in this comprehensive package. Sure, so I can speak to each one. Yeah. Um, so with respect, respect to the overhead, the 40% the is set by HUD. Um, and as I mentioned, it does not cover all of NYCHA's costs. So in terms sorry, of- Are you required to spend 40% or is that a matter of discretion? You can go as high as 40%. So we can go as high okay, as 40%. Okay, so I think that's an important distinction. But, but I would also just add, right? So um, what's important to note is with this reform- Does that strike you? Do you think 40% is high? So I, I think it's actually- far reasonable for... You think 40% overhead for a program is so, reasonable? But it's not 40% for a program, it's 40% for NYCHA to fulfill its obligations with respect to resident associations. And that extends beyond TPA. Okay. So that's that's the point that I... You is, know, is that consistent with the norm in city government or in government in general? 40% overhead for programs or So operations? there's work that HUD requires NYCHA to do that it's not funded to do. Obviously our core business is being a landlord. The way that, that HUD has set up TPA funding is essentially to provide the housing authority with work that's, that's on to meet its resident obligations with respect to 964. And so the funding is not only for administering TPA fund, it is for uh, certifying over 200 plus resident associations, it's for the work required to create new associations, it's for the work required to engage residents. It is a very broad set of activities which can be charged to TPA funding, most of which right now NYCHA is funding through general see, I see net, uh, administrative overhead as a necessary evil because more dollars spent on admin are fewer dollars spent on actual programming and engagement of the residents. So. It, it would. Well, that, that, I, I appreciate the applause, but this is a city council committee hearing, and mm -hmm. and, and, and so it would see. It would seem to me that the goal should be to limit overhead as much as possible. How do we? Would you, Would you be willing to transfer, if you had HUD's approval, the administration of TP, TPA funds that can do it with much less administrative overhead than NYCHA can? So 
can I speak? Okay, let me explain to you what our long term plan is with respect to TPA. So as I mentioned, we have ten people right now who are within resident engagement who who oversee TPA. Um, as we transition to the commercial card, those people will actually be the folks who are working in the zones who are redeployed as resident engagement coordinators. And so the work of the resident engagement coordinator is not only administering TPA, they are the one to one point with the resident association, they handle elections, they handle a number of the responsibilities that are front line um, and are more programmatic in nature. And so there are a number of efficiencies we've created with this reform. Um, a lot of what we're doing uh, in our central unit is very, uh, you know, processing invoices and procurements and purchase orders. And the goal of transitioning to the commercial car was to begin to move those activities to more frontline roles through our resident engagement team. I think similarly, we obviously have a big task ahead of us with creating new resident associations at developments where RAs don't exist. And again, that's the work that would require NYCHA to commit staff resources and staff time to make that happen. And so those are the ways that we would use the, the funding um, to make sure that we have the resources So I take necessary. it that it, reducing administrative overhead so that we can free up more dollars for programming, that's not a goal of NYCHA's? So this is a way that we use our funding to cover the cost associated of well, the, I understand the programmatic that's a, work that I, we're doing. I, I, I'm, and I get there's a, rea there's a fiscal reality you have to grapple with. I understand that, right? And but so I'm I, asking about goals. It, like, are you going to strive toward a world where you can limit administrative overhead so that we have more dollars available to residents? Whether you achieve that goal is a separate question, but I want to know what your goal is in relation to administrative overhead. So our goal is to make sure that these funds are used for their purpose and the funds that go to residents are used for that purpose. And okay. we, we know that that does require work on NYCHA's end to make that happen. Um, our work is it's resident facing. It's, it's frontline work. And there would always be a need for that to happen. Um, what you're describing as administrative overhead is really the work of frontline resident engagement coordinators who are out working with tenant associations every day. So I'm assuming, I, I'm assuming no is the answer to my question. I don't want to dwell on this. Um, how many employees in NYCHA are exclusively responsible for the administration of TPA funds? So there are the 10 employees within the resident engagement department. So, so those 10 employees exclusively handle TPA funds. That's the... So they're exclusively responsible. Okay. And, and what's the overall budget that you have for those employees? So the cost of those employees um, is the, about one8 million. Um, that, inc that includes some of our budget, uh, the full-time equivalent of some budget staff. Um, and then the, the TPA funds are about 1.5. Now, I imagine one of the goals of your reforms is to more efficiently procure, and we're gonna, I'm going to ask mm -hmm. questions about procurement later on, but it's to more efficiently procure goods and services, right? Mm -hmm. And I would think as you achieve greater efficiency, as you more efficiently procure goods and services, there would be fewer employees required to do that. So I'm not clear why the efficiencies in, in procurement will not lead to less administrative overhead mm -hmm. and therefore more funding for services for residents. Exactly. So I, can, I will explain again what, what, this, what we're doing with this process. So we have the 10 staff who are managing what is essentially the old TPA process. They are managing the proposal by proposal submissions as we transition staff, as we transition resident associations into the commercial card. Um, as Ms. Hudson mentioned, we have 15 resident engagement coordinators who are specifically working with resident associations who have the commercial card. TPA is a portion of their time because they're doing more programmatic work engaging residents. Our goal as we transition all of our resident associations, or at least 80%, into the commercial card is to decentralize that team. So it sounds like the, those employees in your unit are not exclusively responsible for the administration of TPA funds, but are taking on what could be noble engagement work that has no direct connection to TPA funding. That's what it sounds to me. Is that a, a fair characterization? Or So what I described to you were 10 who are exclusively responsible, 15 staff who have other responsibilities who are only working on with residents who are in the pilot. And so the roles that once we are able to bring at least 80% of our resident associations into the commercial card process, that decentralized, that centralized exclusive TPA team would be redeployed to frontline positions within our department that are more programmatic in nature. So you would have a very small administrative team that's only handling large procurements. Now, you, so you're investing dollars in this frontline staff, right? Have you ever ask NYCHA residents whether is it, is it better to have dollars spent on that frontline staff or more dollars 
for programming and goods and services mm -hmm. relating to resident engagement? Like, is that a question that you ever posed to the resident leaders, or programming of of what sort? The dollars in which the how you use the dollars, how you the services on which you might spend these dollars, the programs, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the various uses of TPA funds are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to the extent that NYCHA still requires staff, and we will re require staff to be able to meet our responsibilities with respect to 964, um, we would always anticipate that there's a need to use the administrative dollars for that purpose. That doesn't mean that we don't engage residents around ways to build programming. Uh, much of the work that we do that's programmatic, however, we get through external resources. And so we regularly seek external resources to be able to implement programs. Now, there were a number of resident leaders who testified that when they asked NYCHA for an accounting mm -hmm. of their TPA dollars, that NYCHA could not provide them with that information. Mm -hmm. so and, the and I found that striking mm -hmm. because, as I understand, there's one formula of $25 per unit, which applies uniformly across every development. Mm -hmm. So given that formula, like what explains NYCHA's inability to provide residents with an accounting of the TPA fundings that each development would receive? Mm -hmm. So every development, when we rolled out this new process, received what their current allocation is and what their back fund amount is. That's the first time that that information has been made available, and so that was a key piece of the reform, making sure that people have clear accounting moving forward. I, I, I just, and I understand that's a great thing that that information, why was that information so not available I, in the last three years? Sure, so what I can say, I mean, I can I certainly can't speak in detail to the past, but I can give you some uh, overview of what has occurred. Um, for many years, as you heard from the resident associations who testified before us, this was something that was allocated at, and tracked at the district level. So the districts adopted budgets that were made up of the allocations of their developments, and then they expended against those budgets. Certain resident associations also expended against their budgets. So while we can certainly let a resident association know what their allocation was, their expenditures are part of the district expenditures, and that has been the fundamental challenge. No, the resident leaders are claiming that they did not know what their allocations were. So the allocation but, is something that we can provide. It's based on the formula. So and, that and so I that's information that you you've had the ability to provide to every resident leader from the very beginning, or so. We've never not been able, to, we can provide the allocation amount. What we can't provide is the actual expenditures because their expenditures were also <laughs> part of what was in the district. I, I, okay, I will say that a number of years ago I asked for the allocations for each development and I could not obtain that ni information from NYCHA. So I find your answer to be quite strange and it's inconsistent with the testimony that we've heard. Um, so the f dollars would flow to, through the district council W was there was there a portion of those dollars to which the local resident leaders were entitled? Yeah, sure. So um, we have each each district adapted a budget annually. So as an example, Bronx North for their 2015 budget, their total allocation for the collective developments within Bronx North was two hundred thousand two hundred eighty eight thousand four hundred and two dollars. That was the total for all developments. The district adapted a budget that year of $221,940, which left $66,462 left over to be dispersed amongst, amongst the developments within the district. So why not, if there were resident leaders who were wondering about their allocations, why not, since you have the same formula for every development, why not put it online and say, you know, here's how, here are the number of units in your development, and here is the dollar amount to which you're entitled. And it will, it will not vary from, what varies is the proration, mm -hmm. but the underlying proportion remains the same from year to year. So and why not put that information online? Absolutely. So that's exactly, so we provided the resident associations with their information this year. Um, our goal, January 1, is to make this information available publicly online. Why not tomorrow? So one of the things. Like, I could do 25 times 170,000 units, or I can take your development and like I understand it seems simple arithmetic so, so we we can absolutely do that um, I think what we heard in the feedback from resident associations um, was that they wanted to be able to weigh in on how that information was presented uh, so that residents also had a sense of how they were using the funding and their activities we can certainly make that available not January 1st but as immediately that information we can certainly make it publicly available okay let us know the allocation absolutely. to which each development is entitled okay and, and now under your new reforms, the dollars would no longer flow through the district councils, but instead Directly. local councils? Yep. So it's an effort to promote 
local control. Do you, do you have a sense of what impact that will have on the district councils or? So what that means is that the resident associations have to have a choice in funding the district councils. They have to affirmatively opt in to do that. Um, and that's exactly what we heard from the resident associations when we had the focus groups. Um, and that's what we've provided. And do you anticipate that most leaders will opt in or opt out? I think it's a mix. Um, and I think that it depends on the district. And so there certainly are variations across the city um, and certain you know, different dynamics within the districts. And so our role is to really administer the funds the way that they're supposed to be allocated. Um, and you know, the district leaders and their executive boards would work to encourage their membership to participate. Well, I mean, imagine if I'm a resident leader, I'm a rational actor, and I have a choice between directly controlling my dollars or ceding control of those dollars to the district, which choice am I more likely to make? So it's not ceding control of the dollars, it's funding the district at a portion of your, your allocation. So they still retain control, but they're allocating a portion of their budget to the district. Well, and who would, spend that, who would spend that portion? It's the not district determines the district. what okay, the spending so. is for so the I'm portion that's allocated to so the district. So that's what I mean by ceding control. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I think it, there's a mix. So what we heard from resident associations were um, if you're a small development, for instance, you may find benefit in aggregating your resources and participating in the district. Um, if you are as large as Queensbridge, for instance, you may, you know, the district budget is almost a lot, is a lot of your budget. And so I think that there's a mix in terms of um, how, how resident associations want to uh, work in the district. I think what's most important is that the district outline its plans for the years, for the year and how it plans to use the funding. That's the, that's the key piece in determining whether the resident association would participate. <coughs> what, what is the, the standard for determining because I'm, I'm, I lack, just, just like there's confusion about the dollar amount to which each development is entitled, there's confusion about what are the proper uses of TPA funds. So what, what's the standard for determining an activity's eligibility for TPA funds? Mm -hmm. So the guidelines are set by HUD. Um, they're to improve quality of life. Uh, HUD provided more guidance on this um, in more recent years. And so um, activities such as a, a training program or um, uh, literacy services, or cleanup days, or inf or services. What's that would the broad standard? Like, so what broader, is, is there a phrase they use? Education to improve resident quality of life, promote because efficiency. Improving resident quality of life can mean picking up dog poop. Exactly. Like that, that, but so, I don't think that's the intended use of TPA. For exactly. Me. And so one of the things that we provided in the guide look, but guidebook is a list of what's permissible, a list of what's not permissible. So for instance, an amusement park ride at a family day would not be a permissible activity. Um, but you know, an educational uh, or, or health fair activity would be. And so because the, the guidance is very specific, we've provided actual examples of what's permissible and what's not permissible. So it sounds like based on those two examples, is the location of the programming what's relevant? That if the, if the, if the programming is provided on NYCHA grounds? So it, it's based on the intended purpose. So if it's promoting an educational activity, um, or building membership for the resident association, for instance, it would be a permissible activity. Um, if it is strictly entertainment or amusement, it would not be a permissible activity. What if a tenant leader were looking to allocate a share of his or her budget to a local community center or a senior center? Would that be a permissible use? For the activity. For the activity, but if any uh, equipment or supplies, they would not be able to. And why not? It's an ineligible activity, according to HUD. So HUD specifically says that? So the guidelines are... So even if it's equipment that enables you to do the activity, it's ineligible for TPA funds? If it's for the resident association's use, continued use, but if they're dedicating, let's say, furniture to supply, you know, equip the community center, no, it's not. Understood. Do you have a list of best practices? Because, I, I, I mean, I think the more guidance you can provide residents on the best use of TPA funds, the better. Do you have a list of best practices mm -hmm. in the use of TPA funds that you provide residents? So we have a few examples um, of what other resident associations have utilized the funds for. Um, one example, Batanzas has the TA supported their Youth Leadership Council most recently with their efforts to clean the development and um, host a Green Day. Mm -hmm. So TPA funds were set aside for that. Um, at Lincoln Houses, we have a computer training program to help seniors become comfortable with technology, and which also leads to the um, online certification that we have. 
Queensbridge is a wonderful example of a senior uh, music therapy program that is being used to reduce social isolation among seniors. Um, at Red Hook, and this is one example that I really um, you know, appreciate and love is, um, and she's here now, one of our CCOP members, had an ESL program for the increased Asian population in her development, recognizing a need to service and meet the needs of all of the residents. Um, versus there, versus Mott Haven, who could not really establish a quorum for about five years, and of eight to 10, consisting of eight to 10 residents, couldn't establish a quorum for five years, yet that president accessed TPA funds to attend multiple Section 3 conferences across the country, and that those funding, that funding was not really using to serve the residents of Mott Haven. That was at the district level. So the other examples that I gave are really great so examples. I take it that you object to the utilizing section, the use No, of absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's, it's, this effort is to bring the funding and the use of the funding directly to the residents of the development, which is something that we've heard that was needed. So those examples that I gave were great examples of Those are great examples, but, but I, I don't know if I heard you correctly, that it seems like you objected to the use of TPA funds for Section 3 I conferences. I did not. Okay. No. What did you say in relation to Section 3 conferences? I gave a, a comparison of the tenant association using the district funds to obtain training for himself versus the funds going so like to the development. That's an unfavorable comparison. You're making a point about Section 3. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I, I, I just want to. the funding, the examples okay. where the funding was put to use for residents of the development was more favorable. So, okay. That's, I want you, as long as you're honest about it, right? That, that, um, absolutely. So it seems like your argument is that we are decentralizing budgeting to the local council so that the dollars are spent so in the local the development. Local is that your position? Utilize the dollars. Okay, I just want to directly for their residents. Now, the resident council is the only vehicle for accessing TPA funds. It is. Um, so HUD does allow where a resident council has not organized, the PHA can use those fund that, that funding to the benefit of the beneficiaries at the development, um, also to encourage the formation of a, of a new resident council. And so for many years, because this was part of the district budget, NYCHA did not use the those allocations for that purpose. So. Okay, um, that's a shocking, I, that's a surprising answer. So you, you do have some mechanism by so which you can spend these forward. dollars. So how do you, how many, how, how large is the pot of unspent TPA funds? So, so the, spot of, the pot of unspent TPA funds, uh, so funds awarded before 2016 w was around 13.5 million, and that was reallocated to, act to all of our resident associations. Um, for the developments that do not have active TAs, uh, those fundings were also reallocated, and part of the work that we're currently doing around election reform would be used to encourage resident associations to form. So since we've launched NextGen, we've built over 30 new resident associations at this point, and we're doing the work to start How many associations? 30. 30. It, since, to, to, since we've launched NextGen. So you had $13 million, if I understood, of unspent TPA dollars at one point, and, but you've since allocated it? Is that it's been reallocated to the developments, and everyone, all the resident associations, receive their balance in December. And what about, well, what about the developments that have no resident associations? So the developments that do not have resident associations, they would have their reserve funds, so that portion of the $13.5 million and their current allocation could be used for the encouragement of a new board. So we could, for instance, use that funding specifically to support... So let's be honest, election. what about if there's a development that is unlikely to ever have a resident mm -hmm. council? Right? That's a painful thing to yeah. say, right? Like, how, it's not in anyone's interest to have those dollars languish. Mm -hmm. So why not put those dollars to productive use for programming for the residents Absolutely. of that local development? Absolutely. So that's part of the reason why, that we've decentralized this. I think, you know, the, the thinking in the past was that because it was part of the district, it was to their benefit. I don't think you're answering my question. So, um, yes, I understand you're decentralizing. I'm referring to those developments that have no resident councils. Yes. So there's nowhere to decentralize it. So what do we do? with the dollars that are languishing in those developments? So we can do two things. We can use them to support the formation of a board. We can also use it for eligible activities for residents at those developments. So NYCHA could use those funding, that funding for a digital van. It could use it for a, a, a language program, a training program. We could put those funds to good use for the benefit. So have you put there. those dollars to good use? To this point, no. This is the first time that NYCHA has actually been able to access. But that sounds separate, almost scandalous to me. Funds. Like you have a pot of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. 
and public housing residents are the most poorly served in our society. There are young people who have nothing to do in their local communities. How could we justify mm -hmm. not so, spending those dollars on programming for our seniors and for our youth? This is exactly why we change the process and we fix it moving forward. It is we certainly want to see those funds being used for that purpose. The process that we had in Which the past is frustrating that it took three nature three years. I'm talking to the new administration or now we're entering the fourth year to figure out, you know, maybe we should spend these dollars. So we started this process in 2015. For that reason it was one of the first goals set in next gen to reform TPA and we, you know, brought it to the finish line, and so that's exactly how we would use those funds where the representation does not exist. Okay. Do you have some sense of how you're going to spend those dollars in developments that have no resident councils? Or? So our first goal is to try to encourage the resident council. So we started with educational materials and a campaign to lead to a central election. Um, we would certainly engage the residents to understand the needs of that neighborhood, and we would make it specific to the community. So it could be filling the gap, buying program slots for residents in certain uh, programs. It could be leadership development training. We could use it further towards the Resident Leadership Training Academy. There are many ways that we can utilize it. We can also use it to expand existing programs and target it to those neighborhoods. And how long are you willing to wait for a resident association to emerge before you decide that so we have to decide? Our election reform plan leads us to uh, Central Election Day in the fall. And so we would know within the fall how many new associations are in place. Um, and at that point, we would be able to roll over the allocation into a central TPA fund and start using it to benefit those residents. And so by fall, you'll have a strategy for how to spend the unspent dollars and the resident in developments that have no resident Absolutely. Classes? Okay. We'd be happy to, to share that with you. Okay. And what kind of programming would you have in mind for? So, as I mentioned, it would be every neighborhood's unique. We would make it specific to the community. Uh, you know, there's certainly proven programs that we have right now that we could expand and direct to those neighborhoods. Um, there are needs for seniors, uh, youth. We would base it on the population and what we're hearing from residents as we're engaging them. What, what percentage of public housing developments have no resident councils? So we have about 76 developments that are not represented at this time. And, and those that do have resident councils, are all of them eligible to use TPA funds? Yes. Okay. And what are, what are the, you have to have a board of five elected members, is that the criterion? Mm -hmm. okay. I noticed that one of the eligible uses of TPA funds lies in consulting. Right. Is that is that correct? Yes. And w when I see consulting and politics or in any, you know, I, I always have concerns, right? So w have you ever had concerns about, have you predatory consulting services or predatory consulting firms? Or? Mm -hmm. So, so yes, um, we, resident associations um, can choose their own consultants. Um, we're not able to direct them on how to, how to contract. Um, if they satisfy the procurement requirements, um, we would, we are essentially, they would move forward, right? Um, so there are some limitations to how NYCHA can direct resident associations when it comes to consulting. Um, what we can do, and part of the reason why we've introduced these, you know, staff who are providing coaching, et cetera, is to pr offer some guidance on what quality services are. So um, if you are contracting for a training program, you know, these are some of the best-in-class providers. These are the ways that you should look at that. Um, additionally, where we know that there are funds being expended um, repeatedly on uh, training, we've also have found ways to bring those trainings to residents for free. So Section 3 is a great example where we have a number of resident associations who've gone to Section 3 consulting trainings. Um, we worked with HUD to come to New York and give that training for free. Um, and so when we're able to do that, it gives us the ability um, to make sure that, that the need is being met and we, you know, and resident associations may not need to procure that service. Look, and I, I, I do not mean to suggest that all consulting is predatory, but there are certainly predatory forms of consulting. And you're telling me that if you have reason to believe or suspect or have concerns that a particular firm or a particular consultant could be predatory, you're powerless to address that? So what I'm saying is that if there are, if there are reasonable concerns, um, we would follow the appropriate channels if, you know, if that were the case. Um, if there are, if there's a need, uh, if there are services available for free, however, um, that are being procured through the consultant, that's, so, you know, just to clarify my, my point, um, our concerns are more around if there are services available for free that are of quality, 
um, that we want to make sure that the, we're directing people towards those services or we're helping them get to those services um, so that they can use their funds in other ways. Have there been any particular consultants or particular consulting firms of concern to you? or um, to, to the organization? So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We should be able to hear what's happening, sir. Can we, do we have enough space for? Hold on, hold on, for, hold on. Ex excuse me, um, do we have enough? How many people are out there? We're going to recess for five minutes, if you can. Thank you.
Test, 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 one, two, three. Test, 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 one, two, three. Are you copying, Chief? Yes. Test, one, two, three. Test, one, two, three. Ten, four. Okay, we're gonna resume the hearing. I wanna apologize for the momentary chaos. I wanna thank the resident leaders for holding us accountable, um, even in real time. <laughs> uh, so NYCHA is not the only target of the tenant's wrath. I just wanna, uh, um, so I do wanna explore the, like have there been particular consultants or consulting firms that have been a concern to you? Or? Sure. So there have been consulting firms that have been concerns to NYCHA. Um, those are reported to the Department of Investigation uh, accordingly, um, and they've investigated, and if, uh, some are ongoing. Um, outside of that, if there are just concerns in terms of quality of services or making sure that people are getting something that may be free, then we would connect. And so like one possible red flag is the dollar amount that a consultant might receive, right? Yeah, so um, they're using our procurement channels. So if right. there are some triggers around the dollar amount, um, you know, ongoing use of the service, um, we would flag that and, you know, forward to the Department of Investigation to... What's the highest a dollar amount that you've seen a single consultant or firm receive in TPA funds? I don't know. Um, I, We'd have to follow up. Do you have any? Um, do you, do you know? I mean, like an, I'll, I'll ask that. You might not have a specific. Yeah. Do you think it's in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? millions. That's <laughs> don't think it's. I don't think it's in the millions. But it, it sounds like it could be in the hundred thousands. So I, I'm not sure. We would have to get back to you. I don't think that we. I don't think that there have been consulting contracts that large. Um, some of this uh, precedes us, but we certainly can follow up. <laughs> and how, how do you? So beyond, beyond, I guess I have questions about the engagement and also the agreement. Mm -hmm. What led NYCHA, I, I understand that you're legally required to have the tenants enter into two agreement, right? That's a HUD rule, is that, mm -hmm. that NYCHA has not been following? So you, NYCHA had an agreement with the CCOP. Okay, so instead you're gonna have, so is it, are you required to have an agreement with the individual resident councils or you can have an with agreement with any council. entity? We, we had it, yes, we're required to have it with the resident councils. Um, okay. We had it with the CCOP as a jurisdictional body because that's how we administered the funding. And does HUD prescribe the manner in which you have to craft that agreement? or? Um, it, it needs to be an agreement um, and it needs to have the component, it needs to be able to have the components that are additionally included. Um, so we need to include content around making sure that it's a recognized council that we're meeting the requirements of the program. Look, there are resident leaders who, who can quote HUD regulations mm -hmm. chapter and verse, mm -hmm. and it, it sounds like Chinese, you know, it sounds like a uh, foreign language to me, mm -hmm. but, um, but most resident leaders have no legal training, mm -hmm. have no knowledge of obscure legal text, and so like what would possess NYCHA to have tenant leaders sign a legalistic agreement without the benefit of legal training or legal representation? Like that just seems like a bizarre decision to make mm -hmm. to me. Sure. So we circulated the uh, agreement, and you know, as I noted, we had over 100 resident associations who did move forward with signing. Some who got counsel. Um, resident associations had access to their funding this entire time. Legal services would be an eligible cost, but most use free legal services. And so, um, there's right, two hold that please, please. There's no. So there's two things to note. Um, we we certainly have heard the the concerns, and so that's exactly why we were pleased to get feedback from legal aid to work with them, we're using those comments, we're simplifying the language. Um, I would say that, you know, resident associations regularly, um, you know, they have bylaws, they, you know, many uh, have protests with respect to their elections. Um, we often see resident associations who use legal services for day-to-day -day matters um, when engaging with NYCHA, um, but we know not all do. And so that's precisely why we're, we're, we got the feedback from legal, Brooklyn Legal Services and from Legal Aid and we've amended it. And are you allowing the resident leaders who have signed the agreement to sign a Absolutely. new agreement? 
Absolutely. So that agreement is no longer applicable, is that? So we will circulate that new agreement so that everybody yeah. has one agreement. But I just, because there are lawyers who have read the agreement mm -hmm. who, who find some of it confusing. So, uh, and I understand, I, I appreciate mm -hmm. that NYCHA did act on the feedback of Brooklyn Legal Services mm -hmm. and Legal Aid, but why would you, I, I'm just, it's just mm -hmm. baffling to me that you would provide residents with a legal contract mm -hmm. with no guarantee of legal representation. Like that, that seems to be, there's something wrong with that because mm -hmm. you have a wealth of information, mm -hmm. you have legal resources at your disposal, mm -hmm. whereas NYCHA residents, it can be a one person show. Sure. So as I, this is precisely why we have gone back and we've simplified the agreement. Um, you know, I should note, however, that but resident... Not, and I understand that you've yeah. gotten feedback, right? But like in the beginning of the process, mm -hmm. did, did it ever occur to you independently of the feedback that maybe this is too complicated or convoluted an agreement to expect residents who have no legal training and legal representation to sign? So resident associations have... They regularly, they have bylaws, they issue protests. No, but, the re but the resident, These excuse me, I'm sorry, no commentary, so, please. So no commentary. we understand that our resident association. No, but bylaws, as a, a resident range. leader, I have a role in crafting the bylaws, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you know, it's going to be framed in a language that I can understand. The residents had no role in crafting this agreement. Mm -hmm. So, like, it, maybe it did not occur to you that this would be an issue, but... Did so, it ever occur to NYCHA that this would be an issue? So we didn't expect that NYCHA would bring in the legal services on behalf of the resident associations, that the resident associations would independently seek that. And so, so, you, wait, I just, so you crafted an agreement based on the assumption that the residents would have the benefit of legal representation. So we crafted an agreement based on the – to provide to our resident associations some – got independent legal advice, not all did. And so we got the legal advice on their behalf so that we can move forward with an agreement. After they went out and got Legal Aid Society and other groups to come to NYCHA, and then we were able to come to an agreement. And did you know that the resident leaders were guaranteed to have that legal guidance before signing the agreement? So they had the availability of their funding as well as legal services to, to be able to bring in independent legal advice if they needed to. Um, okay. The the engagement. So n the residents have are claiming that NYCHA has has failed to properly engage them in the process uh, before of formulating these reforms. Right? How do you respond to that criticism? So um, this engagement started in 2015, as I mentioned. Um, it started with our citywide council of presidents. Um, <laughs> we've had meetings. We've had focus groups. We've had feedback throughout. Much of what we have proposed and much of what these reforms reflect is consistent with what we heard from residents. Um, I think that we have certainly not received throughout this process substantive um, feedback from our citywide council of presidents, and we've made multiple attempts at engagement. Um, but I think that the overwhelming majority of resident associations who were part of this process, who engaged with us, many of whom have come here today to speak positively about this process, um, are pleased with these changes, and this reflects that. We had over 40 workshops okay, I'm and sorry. meetings. And can we... And focus I'm groups. sorry, this is not meant for anyone's comedic enjoyment, or this is not... I, you're, we're just here to respectfully watch, and, and you'll have an opportunity to testify after NYCHA's done. And we had over 40 workshops, meetings, focus groups. Our team has been deployed all across the city um, to work with resident associations throughout this process. And so there certainly has been engagement, and it's ongoing. Um, you know, this is a pilot for a reason. So as we have the commercial card, there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I'm not questioning NYCHA's motives, right? But I, I can understand if you're, you're a resident, you're up against this Goliath bureaucracy of 11,000 employees, mm -hmm. right? And NYCHA has all the power. And you often feel like when you go to these meetings, you're not actually being engaged. You feel like you're being informed about reforms that were decided well before. Mm -hmm. Like, do you understand why residents might have that feeling or... Sure, which is why we had focus groups at the beginning. I mean, if you can speak to... Yeah, yeah so in the very beginning, after we uh, recognized the hierarchy of the jurisdictional wide body and met with CCOB <laughs> and requested meetings with uh, districts, and we actually met with three district boards um, to talk about the road to reform and needing to reform the process, we then went to the uh, resident associations and extended invitations to participate in focus groups. We held 
11 focus groups in each of the boroughs, AM and PM sessions, to make sure that they were accessible okay. to everyone who wanted to participate. And we received participation from 111 resident associations in these focus groups. The focus groups, we didn't have a process at that time. We opened up a dialogue in the context of Next Gen NYCHA and needed to reform this process, including the election process. And we uh, received feedback on what resident associations wanted to see in a reformed process. And I'm, I facilitated all the focus groups, and I'm very pleased, with the exception of one, and I'm very pleased that we were able to build a process that How many, how many focus account. groups did you conduct? I conducted 10 of the 11 focus groups. Out of over what period of time? We started in February, and um, they concluded in March. And I have no way of knowing the quality of those focus groups. I was not there, so I cannot judge. But could you provide specific examples of, like specific pieces of input and feedback that specific leaders gave you that might have inspired some of these reforms? So we had um, focus groups in Manhattan, AM and PM session, and what we heard was with regards to TPA, um, that stipends should be on a development meetings agenda. There's an MOU that's required, um, budgets for developments and quarterly district audits, uh, resident driven meetings involve the board, entire tra uh, association for trainings, clear communication, district accountability, copies of the budget, transparency to really understand, a reset to know what they're working with in terms of the reserve funds because everyone understood that there was a pot of money that was not spent over a number of years. Um, to reduce the, the procurement, the time that it took to actually procure services, um, that all associations need to be in good standing, and that's just for Manhattan. Um, so, I, I mean, I can go on for every borough. I don't know. Well, how, how, how widely does it vary from borough to borough, the input it, that you receive? It's 83% of the resident associations wanted to control direct access okay. to their funds at the local level. So local control was the common theme local that you... Local control was the common theme. Were there any suggestions that you heard from tenant leaders that were widely shared but that NYCHA nevertheless rejected? No, actually, um, one, one concern that was widely shared was fear of accessing and uh, managing a large amount of funds. So if, if we were to give them, let's say their allocation was $10,000, concern about being able to manage those funds. So what we did was implement the commercial credit card um, so that we're not directly issuing a check to a resident association for $10,000 each year for them to manage, and I'm just using 10000 as a number. So that was um, one of the... So, so I know the card has been something of a controversy. What What is controversial about the commercial card? Can you... I can't really say. I think it's more of um, concern about using a commercial card and the technology around it. I'm not really sure. So what's Those the point of the commercial card? The, the commercial card is to allow them to make um, purchases under the micro threshold of $5,000 so they can utilize the card for approved proposals and make purchases locally. Yeah, but legally, I, if I'm a tenant leader, I can legally make micro purchases without a commercial card. Right? My understanding Access is that micro purchases requires no procurement process. No. Right. So they utilize the card to make the purchases directly and previously NYCHA no, but let's assume I'm a, on their behalf. Let's say I'm an, I don't mean to, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if, if I'm offending, I apologize. Let's say I'm an elderly person who has an aversion to cr commercial cards. Mm -hmm. but why can I not have the ability to make micro purchases without going through an onerous procurement process? Then we would have to make the purchases with a purchase order on their behalf. And so how onerous is that process? So, I mean, in some of the examples that we have illustrated, for instance, if you, you know, want to order basic office supplies and night just procuring those office supplies, these are going through the same supply channels that we're using for the entire agency. So it could be up to 30 days. Um, with the reform process, you can go right to your local staples and make that purchase. Um, this is a pilot. What does that process look like? So that process is getting a proposal, <laughs> approving the proposal, making sure that it's correct, entering a purchase order, going into our internal sort of supply system where we would select the goods, um, getting those approved. There are a number of approvals because, the, you know, that's the... the, the Even for micro-purchases? Mm -hmm. So 
even NYCHA departments use commercial credit cards for some of these small purchases because they they are onerous if we're so, using. So you're telling me without a commercial credit card, then the only alternative is this o- onerous procurement process so, for micro purchases. That's so the alternative would be that um, the that NYCHA makes the purchase. Um, the reason why we've also used the commercial credit card is because the the requirements also are reconciliation, um, not just by NYCHA but by HUD. So one of the, the benefits of the commercial card is that it makes reconciliation easier for the resident association. Um, we put in a system called Smart Data that essentially uploads the receipts, is able to con- confirm that they're correct, um, and sort of takes some of the administrative burden from the resident association as well. Um, we have our first three, 33 resident associations that are using the commercial card. We launched this as a pilot for a reason. Um, so we know that we'll be bringing resident associations in within waves. Um, you know, as part of the training, there was a full day training uh, session for resident associations that were part of the commercial card, followed by a second day, which was actually in a computer lab, where we sat down with everybody and went through the system um, to make sure that they're comfortable using it. And you said it takes 30 days for NYCHA to procure that's a an ex- basic good or service? It, it could be. That's just an example. Um, we give a timeline of at least 30 days for most could, could we create an expedited avenue for resident leaders? It's the commercial card. That's the expedited avenue. So okay. it's it's not just NYCHA's, you know, securing procuring. It's also the ability to use local vendors versus using NYCHA's large vendors, which are serving the entire agency. So when we procure these goods, they're coming from our large vendors. They're not necessarily coming from a local store. Okay. You, so if you need meeting refreshments, you can do, get do that. Do you have a, a list of free qualified vendors or? So we. I mean, for NYCHA, yeah, we have we certainly have vendors uh, across the city. For the commercial card, though, they're able to um, indicate the vendors that they want to use when they have their quarterly submission. So if there's an Office Max or a vendor that's in their neighborhood, as long as it's part of their, their quarterly submission, they would be able to go and use that. And, and what's the concern about an expedited process for micro-purchases without a commercial card? Are you concerned that the wrong vendors might receive these dollars? Like, what's... Not necessarily. I think that... Um, you know, to the extent that that we have a procurement process in place for the agency, um, we need we're using those resources for that purpose. Right. But the process exists to prevent a misuse of funds. So, what kind of misuse concerns you in relation to TPA funds? Then? So, with uh, with TPA funds, the association is responsible for you know using them within the guidelines. When they're using the commercial card. There's, um, we have real-time access to that information, so there's less of a concern from the resident association and NYCHA around how those funds are being used. Um, we heard from resident associations repeatedly that they didn't want NYCHA to give them a lump sum check of you know $20,000, for instance, for their full allocation, and so this gives them that flexibility. Isn't there a middle ground? Like, so you Let's assume I have no desire to use a commercial card. By the way, I'm in favor of using a card. Mm-hmm. It makes sense to me, but... Yeah. But everyone has their idiosyncrasies. And so assume that I had no desire to use a card, but nor do I want a $20,000 check, yeah. right? Isn't there a middle ground there, like a $500 check? or? So we, <laughs> so our goal is to bring at least 80% of resident associations into the commercial card process by next year. Um, I think, you know, at that point, we can certainly determine where there's a real barrier to using the card if there are some alternatives. Um, I think that as we have started to work with TAs on using the cards, and this is, you know, a range of resident associations, people are more comfortable with it. They're using it. Um, we're almost done with our first quarter of, of use. Um, it's easier. The reconciliation is e- easier. I think what we're hearing from our resident associations who use the card is that they're inc- incredibly satisfied. Um, and they had a range of comfort with using credit cards and using computers before coming into this process. And so I'm confident that we'll be able to to bring our resident associations along, and which is why we're phasing f- folks in. Okay. And I know, Councilman Mendez, do you have questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We've been joined by Council Member Gibson as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, I apologize. I was in another hearing, so I hope none of these questions are rep- Repetitive. Um, my my first question, which is of intrigue to me, is on page three, okay. uh, the third paragraph on the page in your testimony. You talk about the outreach and individuals, elected officials, and others that you've met with. So you 
had a briefing with CCOP, the council's Bronx delegation, which includes our chair, Torres, as part of that delegation, council member Helen Rosenthal from Manhattan. I don't know why you met with her alone. Um, Controller Scott String Stringer, Congressman Jeffries, and Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, which makes sense. So <clears throat> I don't know why the Bronx delegation got a briefing, but the other borough delegations did not. In Manhattan, myself, Margaret Chin, and the Speaker are in the top 10 of most developments within Manhattan. So maybe Manhattan delegation should have gotten a briefing. Um, just to note, Jimmy Van Bramer has the most developments in Queens. Mm -hmm. I don't see that you've met with him. Darlene Mealy has the most developments in Brooklyn. And, and quite frankly, yes, you make a reference to a webinar. My, one of my staff was on, you've been having a lot of webinars. So it was unclear to me um, that this webinar that my staff s sat through was going to result in policy changes that I would have to go back to my 17 tenant associations and deal with the leadership and answer their questions and try to help them navigate this process. So mm -hmm. why did you choose to meet with these individuals and not others? Why was this committee or the members of this committee not briefed? Start with there. Sure. So when we rolled out the process, as mentioned, we did have a, a webinar briefing with that was available to electeds generally, but um, we briefed elected officials who had expressed particular interest in uh, TPA, who had concerns over the years that they had expressed towards NYCHA, um, and who had constituents who were proactively um, expressing concerns about the process. So we'd be happy to sit down with you and, and give a more detailed briefing, um, as well as the rest of the delegation. Thank you. That's a little bit too late. However, I don't know how people express interest. I've expressed mm -hmm. interest. I used to chair this committee. Mm -hmm. This is an issue that's come back and forth, so I just don't know why I and other members of this committee who currently sit on this committee were left out. Mm -hmm. You would think by virtue of the fact that we sit on this committee, we would have an interest in it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so that was my, my, my first question. Um, how many developments are there in the authority right now? 326. 326. Of those 326 developments, how many RAs or TAs, whatever we want to call them, are authorized, how many are merged, and how many are unauthorized? So we have 250 associations, um, and we have around 70 plus 76 developments. Um, where we would work to encourage associations to form. S that number doesn't jive because I know they are merged associations. So that adds up to 326. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't take into consideration which associations emerged. Mm -hmm. Or are you still trying to encourage, even after merger, that those TAs try to start their own association? Sure. So I think in a few instances we have some consolidated, but most are representing individual developments. So we can get the exact number of unrepresented developments um, to the extent that some of the 76 are part of a merged association. Okay. I know some of the 76 are part of the merge. Okay. So I would like that. that number. Sure. And I'm sure my chair would like that number also. Um, <clears throat> So on page three, the second to last paragraph, um, you say you formally introduced a new process to resident leadership through multiple workshops with HUD. So I was wondering when were those workshops held? And since those workshops, how many of those TAs uh, have changed board membership pursuant to a election? So we rolled out the new process. Uh, well, so the, the engagement process started in 2015. There were focus groups. There were report November of 2015. November of 2015. Um, and went on for over a year where there, in, where there were focus groups, engagement meetings, et cetera. Um, when we rolled out the new process, that was in December of last year. Um, we had a series of workshops that included HUD that 
you know, both my, Janelle and myself presented at. Um, and then we went into the new year. I think between January and May, we haven't had um, significant board turnover or changes, but if we did, there would only be a few. Um, we've made sure that as uh, resident associations move into the new process that they have vacancies within their board filled, if, if they exist. Okay, so you do not know how many, but you think it's not very much, the associations that have elections since January of 2017. Is that correct? So we can give you the number of elections that have occurred in that, that, those five months, um, as well as the number of, of elections that may be underway. Five and a half. We're in the middle no, five of five and a half months. So we can let you know how many elections have occurred, um, and you know, particularly the ones that are within your district. And then, um, you know, moving forward, elections are ongoing. And so as new officers come in, they would take responsibility for the, for the funds. Um, if there are vacancies and they're filled, they would take responsibilities. We haven't had associations that um, have become inactive over the past five months. Um, could you also tell me how many associations had leadership changes through an election between November 2015 and December 2016, because it would be important to know what was happening throughout that year. I know lots of my resident associations are not meeting on a monthly basis, and I know there's been change in some of that leadership so that some of this information would not have been uh, given to the new leadership as they were transitioning the board members. So I'd like to know that. Um, so on page six, you refer to your administrative fee, which is 40%. Um, is that the typical administrative fee for public housing authorities throughout the United States? Yes. So that is the fee that's set by HUD. It's standard across all housing authorities. And how long have you been, there was a time where you did not, take an administrative fee even though you could have. Mm -hmm. And then that changed with your fiscal issues throughout the years. When was the first time that you started uh, taking the administrative fee? So that certainly precedes me. I would have to follow up and get that information. My understanding is that the administrative, the, the cost has always been part of what NYCHA has absorbed. So just for background, these are operating funds. They come in with our general operating funds. We have a portion, $15 per unit, that goes to the resident association. I'm, the remainder I'm, stays with... I'm well NYCHA. aware of that. But we would say... I know that the federal government always does unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very admirable that the housing authority did not take the administrative fee, even though they could have. At some point, they changed that policy. Um, I was the chair of the committee at the time, and the administrative fee was a pride applied retroactively. How long have you been working at the authority? Um, so I've been at the authority for almost six years, but in this capacity for less than a year. Okay. Uh, so you deal with all the TPA funds and you do not know when the authority started charging and taking an administrative fee? I can get that information to you. I've known that since I've been in this capacity, NYCHA has had an administrative fee. Okay, Previously, so you I don't know how long. In, Thank in you. TPA funds. Okay. Um, I'd like to know how much for which years, if you can break that down. Sure. What was the administrative fee going back to whenever it was um, and how much the authority uh, took. On page five in your second paragraph of your testimony, um, just because it confuses me, uh, the last sentence of that paragraph says, currently 33 resident associations are piloting the use of the commercial card, and our goal is to have 80% of the RAs using it by next year. So can we just keep it apples and apples, or oranges and oranges? Um, 33 resident associations is what percentage? Or if we're going to have an exact number, then what would 80% of the current resident associations be? So it would be 80% of 250. Um, I mean, we could do, do the math, but um, it would be 80% of the 250 that we have today. Okay. 
So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. This, that's all of my questioning. I, I just need to say that um, when I was in the other hearing reading your testimony, you know, you go to great lengths to try to detail what is a transparent process, but to me, it is not transparent because there are simple things that the authority could be doing along the way to um, get the information to the residents. Um, I know the RAB and the CCAB don't always have all of the members attending those meetings, and even when they do, that information doesn't trickle down to the rest of the leadership and or to the rest of the resident association. And that's something that NYCHA is very much well aware of. Um, why council members who have a lot of developments within their council districts were not advised or the members of this committee is disconcerting to me because my resident leaders contact me on a daily basis. They have my cell phone. And when these changes came about, there was pandemonium because my resident leaders could not understand uh, for uh, the entire process. They never talked to me about the commercial card. Um, they, uh, what they did talk to me about was, and I don't see this anywhere in your testimony, was that they needed to become a 501c3, which to me is, um, I think, kind of arduous. Um, if that is not in fact true, you can let me know otherwise. I also thought that if it was true, that would be very complicated, being that you needed to change, uh, the board would change every time there's an election, um, and that that would cause the board of that not-for-profit to change. So that is, in fact, not true. That's not true. So our relationship is with the resident association that is recognized and certified by NYCHA. There are many resident associations that choose to incorporate themselves as 501c3s. That's, they are, that's a 501c3. Our funding relationship is between NYCHA and the recognized resident association. They do, absolutely do not need to become a 501c3. Okay. And just lastly, I caught the tail end of Chair Torres's questioning regarding legal representation. And um, I just find it reprehensible that tenant leaders are being given legal documents without any legal representation or being told where they can get it or being referred to any of their elected officials who can try to arrange for a lawyer to legally review wherever they would have to sign, particularly in a case dealing with federal funds. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Mendez, and good afternoon. I'm just taking over while uh, Chia Torres steps out momentarily. I'm Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I represent uh, District 16 in the Bronx. I represent a lot of residents of public housing from Claremont Consolidated to Butler, Webster, Morris, uh, Gouverneur, Franklin, Highbridge Gardens, McKinley, Cedric Houses. A uh, lot of residents that uh, really need a lot of support and leadership. And I, I want to ask a question very quickly. Um, in your testimony, you talked about kicking this uh, initiative off in November of 2015. So I'd like to know from November 2015 to today, uh, in your testimony, you alluded to some of the briefings that you had with elected officials. So unlike Council Member Mendez, I was a part of the briefing with the Bronx delegation, but the delegation meeting you referenced happened a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, since November of 2015, there has not been sufficient engagement with elected officials. So what I'd like you to do, if you can, um, you referenced that you started with a meeting with Chair Olatoye and the CCOP, but where did the conversations with the elected officials begin from November 2015 until today? Mm -hmm. So we started the, the process with our resident associations, um, and as we got into the fall, that's where we began to engage um, some of our elected officials, particularly those who had expressed specific concerns about TPA funding in the past. Um, obviously, this has also been a topic at NYCHA's 
general budget hearings, and so NYCHA has addressed the fact that it would take a look into TPA, and we committed to doing that as part of the next gen plan. Um, we are certainly happy to spend the time, more time specifically, um, with you and the rest of the Bronx delegation to discuss it further. Um, our process of reform um, was more focused on the resident associations and getting their feedback, um, as well as getting feedback from HUD and some of our um, our other stakeholders. But we certainly, you know, take that feedback, and we would be happy to make sure that we fully engage in moving forward. Okay, so I recognize the work that's been done since that time. Um, our meeting specifically was May 24th. May 24th of 2017. So the reason why I bring that up is because I know that HUD and our council presidents and resident associations and NYCHA all have a a major invested interest in this, Mm -hmm. but so do the elected officials. When NYCHA is not responsive to the multitude of emails that I get Mm -hmm. from all of my resident leaders, they come to us. So the challenge for us is that we are almost two years after this launch after this initiative started and a lot of work has been done and the elected officials have not been engaged. I appreciate the elected officials that do reach out to NYCHA and say we would like to get a briefing but I also think it's really incumbent upon the housing authority to do its own due diligence and reach out to us as well. Um, NYCHA is never afraid to reach out to this council and this committee when you need something. Mm -hmm. So every single month I, myself, meet with NYCHA. I meet with the Capital Division on all of the money that I give NYCHA every budget year. This year, $2 million out of my allotment I'm giving to NYCHA. I talk about roofs. I talk about scaffolding. We talk about the brickwork. We talk about every single thing. Not only is it it's a two-way street, so they reach out just as I reach out. When RAD was started, when Next Gen came to my district, mm-hmm. they reached out and I reached out. So where I'm troubled is this didn't happen with TPA. Mm-hmm. And of all the work that has been done with our resident leaders, which it should be, there really wasn't any engagement with the elected officials. So here we are trying to figure out how we can be involved and really try to fix this process. Because although the Housing Authority has done an incredible amount of work, and I give you credit for that, the process was very flawed. And the elected officials should have been included. Mm -hmm. When you need us for something, you always reach out. And this is something where either you did not need us or you did not want us to be included. So I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm included now. Now that I know that this is going on and now that I know that my resident leaders have questions that they're coming to me about that I don't have the answers for, now we're getting involved. So what I'd like to know now, June of 2017, how many um, RA resident leaders have signed off on this agreement, how many are remaining, and what is the current work that NYCHA is doing. I know legal aid is very much involved. Even legal aid reached out to us, and we met with legal aid about their concerns Mm -hmm. to to address this issue. So I'd like to know where are we at now, what can we do, because my biggest concern is the tenant associations who have not signed off on this TPA agreement. Their funds are being withheld, and we have events, we have family days, and I give too much to NYCHA. I'm not giving another penny this year to do the work that you guys should be doing. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to understand where we are with the agreements that have been signed, those that remain outstanding. What are we doing to extend on the deadline? I believe the deadline was like two months ago. Where are we with that, and how can we make this process better? Mm-hmm. Sure. So, so the deadline was May 1st. Resident associations had about 90 days uh, to, to review and turn in the agreement. Over 100, about 113 um, signed off on the agreement. Um, since then, we had discussions after, after May 1st with resident associations, with legal aid. We also received comments from Brooklyn Legal Services. Um, we took those comments and also participated in a workshop that Legal Aid invited us to. Uh, June 5th, we received comments from both Brooklyn Legal Services and Legal Aid. We responded to those quickly. Um, we have a draft agreement that's updated that will go out to them this week, and then we hope to turn that around quickly to our resident associations. Um, in terms of substance, the agreement covers much of what was in the original agreement. It's still are the, re- the requirements by TPA. Um, but we've simplified the language so that it's easier for folks to understand um, and that uh, resident associations feel more comfortable signing on. Okay, so how many tennis associations are remaining that need to still sign this? 
Sure, so we have uh, about 137 pending. Um, of those pending, we have 12 who've, who have expressed strong opposition. Um, we have about 16 or so who have not been active in this process we've been trying to engage, who've, who've been um, somewhat dormant throughout the process that we've been trying to engage. Sure, so we have about um, uh, 137 that are pending. Of those pending, we have 12 who have expressed strong op opposition, meaning uh, opposition to signing an agreement in any form. Okay. Um, we have about 16 resident associations who have just, we've had tra challenging challenges engaging them in this process completely. They've been, uh, for lack of a better term, dormant. Um, and then we have about 100 or so resident associations who um, are willing to sign on to an agreement but certainly need something that's more simplified and are looking for that updated draft. And so that's exactly what we're circulating this week. Um, and then we would get that, that back to the resident associations. Okay. So it's about 109. 109. Okay. So essentially there are 137 pending in the different categories you just described. The opposed, the inactive, and then those that are still reviewing. And so far, 113 have signed. Mm -hmm. So you have more organizations that have not agreed with this than you have those that have agreed, mm -hmm. correct? 137 yeah. versus 113. Yes. Is that correct? That, but I would say that of, the, the, of those who have not signed, there are a mix of people who have, are essentially pending, who are looking for an updated agreement, but in principle believe with the, are in line with the new process. Okay, and, in, and when I spoke to the Housing Authority when this first was brought to my attention, um, I share the concerns of Councilmember Mendez because, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so when I see legal terms and legal documents, I get concerned because I don't want to agree to anything that I don't know what I'm agreeing to. And I think for many of our resident associations, um, not everyone is able to adapt to change in the same way, so there has to be um, a journey, right, mm -hmm. from 2015 even though we weren't a part of that journey, but there has to be some sort of a process. So I was concerned when my leaders came to me expressing their displeasure with signing a document when they had no legal services, legal aid. I mean, it's just very concerning, and I get it. But I said to NYCHA, even your own legal division sees the problems that we have with this type of agreement. So do you think the feedback you received from legal aid is sufficient at this point to move forward uh, with the remaining outstanding uh, TAs? Absolutely. I think it, it captures what we've heard just offline in our discussions with TAs as well as what we got from the, uh, from the workshop, and it was provided you know, by attorneys from Legal Aid, and so I think that we're in a good place to move forward. Okay, and uh, specifically some of uh, the TAs that I've spoken to in the past several weeks, because they have failed to sign their agreement, they are in limbo of facing a disruption of some of their services in their office, like the cable and other necessities that are in the office that need to be maintained. And because we are still in a conversation um, and we're beyond May 1st, I am asking the Housing Authority to delay the disruption of any services at any of these developments that have an outstanding agreement to sign. I think it's really disingenuous. Um, I think it's an insult to the tenants if we allow services to be disrupted. We're withholding money that they rightfully deserve. And I get it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the challenge for all of you is that this has been a HUD policy for many, many years. You've just never enforced it. And so now, in 2017, obviously, you know, we're thinking that there's a reason behind all of what we're doing. And whether we know the reason or not, mm -hmm. we have to do our jobs, and I get it. But I'm very concerned about allowing services to be disrupted because a TA leader says, I don't feel comfortable signing that agreement. And I have my TA leaders that are in that position, and I've spoken to NYCHA. I will talk to the chairwoman directly because I don't think their services should be disrupted. We're still looking at this. We're still looking at language. And I think in all fairness, we should give an extension and make sure that those payments can be approved while we are negotiating the final terms of this agreement. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what I'll say is that um, with respect to these ongoing services, particularly Internet, telephone, et cetera, Correct. my understanding, there are no services that have been impacted by not signing this agreement at this point. I know They're that there's coming. a specific... 
situation in your district. Um, and based on my understanding, that's not necessarily related to the agreement, so I'd be happy to, to discuss oh, that, okay. that further. Okay. Um, but there are, there are other reasons why um, certain services may not be active, and it, 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 it goes beyond having the agreement. So um, outside of that specific uh, situation in, in your district, from our understanding, and when we've gone with have have had these discussions with TAs who have pending agreements, um, there is no one at this risk at risk at this point of having their services disrupted. And our goal is to not um, see folks' internet and phone go down during this process, which is why we're expediting getting the agreement back out to them. Okay, I agree, and that's my goal too. And I assure you that um, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen in the district I represent. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I do nothing, I have to represent their interests. And the fact that I have not been engaged is a different conversation that I'll have at a different day. But the fact that I'm involved now and we want to we help. This is a city council that stands with NYCHA. I've stood with Shola so many times in my district. When we have the, the RAD program, the, the 15 developments, I represent Butler. I've been working with her on so many issues. So I don't think this council is asking for anything unreasonable. I think when we talk with you, we not only demonstrate our support with our mouths, but with money. We have given NYCHA a lot of money every single year after year, um, and I will continue to do that because I know you need the support. Mm -hmm. But all I ask as a member of this council is to respect our position and respect the fact that we are a stakeholder. Do not just call when you need something, but call us when you want to engage in every single thing that you do. I think it's only fair, mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable, and I think it's practical. We want to help you. Mm -hmm. We don't want to criticize on the sidelines, but I, I want to be a part of the work that you're doing because these are all of our tenants. Whether it's an election year or not, my tenants know I speak like this every time, not just in election year, but all the time, because I care about their well-being, I care care about their safety, and I care about the quality of life that they have. And despite who sits in the White House, we have work to do in this council. We have work to do in the Housing Authority. So moving forward, I do not want to have another situation where we have a new initiative, and a year and a half later, NYCHA is coming to us saying, well, we can now engage you. That is unacceptable. Unacceptable. I may not be a resident leader, but we are elected leaders, and it's our job to work with you as partners. So even after today, I will continue to work with all of you and have conversations and do my part to work with my resident leaders. But I want to make sure and be very clear that, you know, services are not going to be interrupted. We're getting ready for family days, which our leaders need their funds. So we want to move this process forward expeditiously, but we want to make sure that it's efficient as well. And I don't want any leader to feel like they're being forced to sign something just so they can get their money. I don't want that to happen. So I ask both of you and your staffs to work with us so we can make this process better for TPA as well as every other initiative that you guys are, are working on under your leadership. I ask for your commitment to work with this council. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to your point, uh, we would certainly make sure to continue engaging you moving forward. Um, Absolutely. And Not two years later. On those, on those specific requests. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, do, do you do you acknowledge that you've made mistakes in real, on on the question of engagement? Or so I think that this has certainly been a challenge with respect to rolling it out. I think we have we you know have lessons learned. We would want to um, you know if we were to roll this out again, we would certainly love to bring our partners at Legal Aid and Brooklyn Legal Services in earlier, and certainly engage the council earlier. Um, you know, we certainly made attempts at that as we rolled out this process, but we, we hear your feedback and we would certainly engage you in our work moving forward. Um, this is something that was laid on the next gen plan. It's one of many uh, transformation processes with respect to resident engagement. Election reform is, is certainly around the corner, and so we would love to sit down and brief the council on that as well so that you're partners with us as we roll these out. Yeah, and it's not only a question of engaging us earlier, but it seems to me you did not engage enough stakeholders. Right, and that's a standard that NYCHA has set for itself. Right, NYCHA has said that what distinguishes us from previous administrations is that we are uniquely committed to resident engagement and stakeholder engagement. And I do find it troubling that it never occurred to NYCHA to engage every single member of the Public Housing Committee, mm -hmm. as Councilmember Mendez pointed out, or to engage 
council members or elected officials who represent heavy concentrations of public housing and who might have a stake in the administration of the TPA program. So I think, do you realize, I think you acknowledge that that was a mistake. Sure, and as I mentioned, as we have these, we have more reform processes underway, and so we would certainly make sure to do that moving forward. Yeah, moving forward, but the reforms that are, have been put in place are a done deal. So these reforms are, they're active now, yes. Uh, what, would, what would the number of resident count, what would the number of developments that have no resident councils again used? Was it 79 you shared? About 76. 76, and so really. your goal is to create resident councils in those developments? over the next few months, is that? Sure, so our goal is to encourage the formation of resident associations. Um, right. This will require on the ground outreach, resident meetings, so nomination process. I, I find organizing to be hard work. Mm -hmm. Like it's one of the most, if you're an organizer, if you're not a build associations, God bless you. I think it's one of the greatest talents. Um, and it's not within NYCHA's core competency to organize tenant associations, That's right? Correct. Like, is that something that NYCHA should be doing directly? Shouldn't you be either rely on organizations that know how to do this or? Sure. So we would seek to work with partners the way that we do with most of our services right. in terms of contracting for services. That's not necessarily something that NYCHA has done. Um, we certainly have formed over 250 associations, 30 of which formed after NextGen. Um, but we would seek to partner with organizations that can you know, assist NYCHA with organizing on the ground. That's the way that we've How many associations have you formed? So there are over 250 associations, and these were formed through NYCHA's efforts, working you, with residents. Do you believe these are associations that would have never formed independently of NYCHA? Is that? So I think residents, right, even when NYCHA has formed an association, it requires residents who are interested in the process. And so right. our role is cr facilitating that access. So it's the outreach. It's making sure residents know what is involved in organizing a resident council. It's identifying the leaders who want to be part of that it, resident council. It, it would seem to me, because I worry that if we, if NYCHA, if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that's the definition of insanity, right? Mm -hmm. And so either give those dollars to an organization that that has the capacity to organize, mm -hmm. right? That does that. That's their core competency. It's not one function among many, yeah. or develop a strategy for spending those dollars in actual programming. So in the absence of a resident council, it, exactly. Like, th those so seem to be the, the two clear options for me. I, I don't disagree. And so, you know, as I mentioned, there there's funding available in the at the developments who have not had active associations. The PJ can use that for a council or for s programs and services. I think our approach towards Direct service has been to transition to partners. And so we certainly could use that funding to work with partners to organize resident councils. There's still a role that the PHA has to have in terms of recognizing the council, but we can certainly outsource could, some of that could, role. Could you, use, could you use TPA funds for political organizing? No. We could not. So, okay. so, so, or civic, meaning that if there, if there, if there are policies, no, if there, I mean, there are policy decisions that are being made in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm that could have catastrophic consequences for public housing and the livelihood of public housing residents. We could not use TPA funds to mobilize res public housing residents to protest? So resident, so absolutely, so residents can use funds. Um, they, they use them to go to Albany, they can use them to go to DC, they meet with their electeds. Um, I think that but those requests come from the residents. Um, they would have to come from- Well, I'm referring to the dollars that are languishing. Mm -hmm. like, like why not use those dollars I'll be, I'll, I'm mm -hmm. part of it, as part of sure. the Trump resistance in some sure. sense. Like that's, um, th that, mean, it might sound amusing, but we're about to have a wedding planner as a reg regional administrator of HUD. And the, the cuts that have been put forward are, are catastrophic, right? The New York City Housing Authority cannot survive mm -hmm. the budget that Donald Trump has proposed. So it's actually not a joke. Mm -hmm. And you have a vested interest in politically organizing, empowering your residents. Why not use the dollars for that purpose? Mm -hmm. So I don't disagree. I think that we would have to make sure that it's permissible use. Um, those requests come specifically from the resident associations. The way that the housing authority can use the funds are, are, are a little bit are more prescribed. And so we could use it to cultivate or identify the leaders who would do that organizing. And so I, there's urgency around this. I think so. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and so 
the time is now, which is why we've been focused on having an election reform process that is targeted to these developments that are not represented. But there are obviously TPA funds available at developments that are represented, um, and we would seek to encourage those resident associations to organize in that way. And now you receive $25 per unit, but does HUD require you to distribute those dollars proportionally, or can you distribute it, distribute it as you see fit? It has to be distributed by dwelling unit. By dwelling unit, okay. Um, Council Member Mendez, I, I understand you had more questions. So. Thank you. Just um, two follow-up questions. One is in reference to um, Council Member Gibson's question, uh, statement that you met with the Bronx delegation May 24th, less than a month ago. Um, can you tell us now or can you get us the information of when you met with Helen Rosenthal, Controller Stringer, Congressman Jeffries, and Spe Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito? We can get those dates to you. Okay. The other question is regarding the unauthorized TAs. What happens to their TPA funds? Unauthorized, meaning that the association is no longer recognized by yes. HM? Sure. So if an association is... I mean, that is your definition, right? Yes. So if there is an association where NYCHA has withdrawn the, the recognition of the, of the tenant association, um, the funds would essentially stay in that development, and NYCHA would encourage a new election. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't withdrawn any recognition during this engagement process. Um, there are a number of resident associations who um, have been delayed in their elections, and so they've been offered a timeline to comply with their elections. Um, but as of between this transition process, we haven't had uh, developments where we've withdrawn recognition. Prior to this transition and changes in TPA, what happened to the TPA funds for unauthorized resident associations? And, and I ask you that because I had a tenants association, the tenant president got ill, stepped down, we could not get an election. I, with the other elected officials, my state senator, uh, Daniel Squadron, and assemblyman Brian Kavanaugh, assigned staff to help organize mm -hmm. a tenant association. Mm -hmm. I got organizers, MSWs, to help organize. We couldn't get an election. We couldn't get enough people interested. People just, they knew what that president went through, and no one was willing to take that on. Years and years went by. I don't know what happened to their TPA funds. Eventually, they were merged with another uh, existing association in my district. So what happens to all that money during that time? So prior to uh, December of 2016, the funds were maintained by district. So the pot of money that we had um, going into December 2016 was 3.5 million approximately, and at that time the funds were equitably distributed across the developments, so this is the first time in December that each development has their own um, TPA allocation budget. So the dollar amount that you're referencing, I'm not sure the timeline that you're, you're speaking about, the money wasn't separated at that time for that development. So every development now has their allocation. So depending on, I can give you the information mm -hmm. specific to the development you're talking about and let you know okay. what the funds are that I'm, are available. I'm having a little trouble wrapping my head around your answer. One is because I don't know what you mean by district, so maybe that might help. Mm -hmm. so what, what do you mean it's allocated by district? No, the funding was maintained, so we had budgets based on the districts, the CCOP districts. CCOP districts. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't withdrawn recognition from any resident association since December, so it's the long to answer your question is the money is still there for that development. So prior to December, um, I took office in 2006, somewhere in between there, one specific TA that I know of in my district uh, was not authorized. Actually, there were a couple. One eventually had uh, an election, but the one that could not, uh, get an election under the bylaws that existed um, all those years. And then a few years ago, they were merged. So all the money, all, that e all those years 
for those units for that development was being held. And then when they merge, it was then given to the other TA that it's now merged into? Is that what you're telling me? So I'll just jump in here. So if there were funds awarded before 2016, those were the funds that NYCHA reallocated across all the dwelling units. So whether there was a tenant association with one certain development that merged with another development, the, the funding that is available to that merge association is based on the aggregate number of their dwelling units. And those funds that were awarded be, in years prior essentially have rolled over um, across the years and have been redistributed. Their new funding would be allocated based on their aggregate number of re dwelling units for that association. Um, so in this particular example, and you know, as Janelle mentioned, we're happy to, to, to you know, for that specific example because that's that's somewhat unique. Yeah. Um, but it would be on the aggregate size of the. I don't think unit. that unique, but yes. Okay. Okay. Happens less frequently. So my understanding then for the seventy six that you're saying is unauthorized, and that could be a little bit more, a little bit less, right? Their funds have been put in the district of the CCOP and it's being held there, and now it's being separated by development. And when, if and when they get authorized, they will be able to access that money. How, ma how many years back they did not utilize it? Is that correct? Sure. So um, for, for the funds that were awarded before 2006 um, that have been redistributed, there's an amount available for these developments that do not have representation. They are still accumulating new allocations. And so, um, you know, I think as in for many years, NYCHA did not necessarily use these new allocations because they were being used at the district level. Moving forward, the way that we would use those allocations is specifically how they're prescribed to help the formation of a new board or for tenant participation activities benefiting those developments. The, the goal is that we quickly form a new association so that they can utilize those funds um, that have, were awarded prior to 2016. Thank you, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to ask additional questions. Councilmember Gibson, do you have any further questions or comments? Just a quick question, um, and I don't know if you got to this before I arrived. The, the guidelines that HUD's put forth on how you can use those particular funds, so can you just explain to us what the regulations are for using TPA funds? What are they used for, and is anything prohibited? Sure. So we can also provide to the council, we have a one-pager that explains what's, what's prohibited and what's not. Um, but in general, they're supposed to be used for self-sufficiency activities, educational activities. Nice. Um, they are supposed to be used to support the resident association leadership to build membership. Um, they could also be used for capacity building. Um, some of the things that are not permissible would be um, activities that are purely entertainment, amusement park rides. Um, purchases of equipment and supplies for for a group other than the resident association. So there's a pretty exhaustive list that HUD provides, um, and we have used that list verbatim to make sure that resident associations have good guidance around this. Um, HUD was also part of our training and spent some time discussing what's permissible and what's not. And so residents access their funds through a proposal process. We would we review the pro proposals based on those criteria. Um, and if there's, you know, a gray area, we would certainly work with the resident association to make sure their proposal is in line with the guidelines. Okay, so prior to December of 2016, you still had this process where you were helping resident associations with putting together, you, as you talked about, a proposal. So what I'm trying to understand is every TA operates at a different level and mm -hmm. capacity. So when you say the money is used for capacity building and self-sufficiency, like, I don't know what that means. Does that mean, like, voter education drives? No so, yeah, forms, so an example, like um, some of the examples that we cited earlier were um, a TA president, one of uh, a, a district, um, district leader, for example, who used the funding to provide an ESOL class at her development where there was a large okay. um, population that did not speak English. Um, that would be a, a perfect example of how these funds can be used. Um, you know, a resident association may... Um, you know, offer in a GED class. We've had examples of resident associations who've used their funds in those ways. So that would be uh, an example. Okay, that also includes um, like OSHA classes, mm -hmm. since we want to build up our residents so they can be uh, in the job market and the workforce to mm -hmm. get better employment and build skills. I, I, I would qualify that as self-sufficiency. Does that also include like OSHA That's classes? That's a permissible use, absolutely. Okay. okay. 
And I, I don't want to change the subject, but, you know, with many of these resident associations, they're also recipients of funds through the city council, mm -hmm. which brings a different level of guidelines. So is are those funds also under your jurisdiction as well, or does that go separate? So those funds come through our department, but we it's a completely separate process. So we administer those funds, but we are not necessarily administering them with the, within the TPA process. So. Okay. So is the money that I'm giving my TA is going to be held up with the TPA funds too? No, it's a completely, we don't commingle those funds. It's a separate process. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. I have a, can you let me know when there's quorum? Is there, is there quorum for... I know you indicated earlier that there was a lack of clarity about mm -hmm. um, about the expenses of the district councils or that you said you could tell the resident leaders the allocation per development, but you could not share the expenses. Is that I'm, so I did not understand your point earlier. So. Uh, so, so let me let me clarify. So I think in some of what you heard even in the testimony earlier was that um, the district councils would adopt a budget. Yeah. Um, and there was not necessarily clarity for the resident associations of what the full expenditures were once once they agreed to adopt that budget. So we can certainly, we can provide detail of what the But that seems spent. like a, a solvable problem. Like yeah, so under the old system, why not just share the resident leaders' information about the expenditures of the district council? So that's something that we can provide. I think what the, the question that we've received from resident associations were like accounting for their specific development over a number of years um, without necessarily accounting for their participation in the in the district budget as well. So where what we can't do is disaggregate the district budget by development. We can give what the district budget was and what the expenditures were. And why can't you disaggregate the district council? So there may be certain expenses in the district budget um, that we could proportionally break it out um, across developments equally, um, but we could not, for instance, say, um, you know, in 2005, you participated in this specific training. So we the, the way that we would break out the district's expenditures would be to just disaggregate it proportionally based on the members. And that's something I think that that's, we can make that, available. That's how people would expect you to do. So Sure. So, I mean, that's, I, that's so something so, that... So that seems be, like a straightforward... Yeah, that that's straightforward. So why couldn't you share that information with the resident leaders over the ne last three years? I don't... So that's something that, I mean, I think... I believe that that's different than what has been requested, but we certainly can share that what the district spent their, their funding on, and the formula would essentially be the dwelling units in that district. I think, you know, Janelle gave an example of what a district adopted as a budget and what the proportion of the development funds went into that budget. That's something that we can share. The, dis the district members also sign off and on that budget, so that's something that they would be And so the of. dollars would flow through the district, and what portion of, the, of those dollars would go to the local council? Each it, district varied. Each district varied. Mm -hmm. So, what what is the variation? So, so in twenty fifteen, uh, Bronx North's percentage of their budget represented I'm sorry, seventy six point ninety six percent for the district budget for Bronx South. What does that yeah. mean? That that if I'm the, if, so so if I'm the TA leader of Throgsnack, seventy six percent of my budget went to the district. The, to the district, yeah. Seventy six. Seventy six for Bronx North in twenty fifteen for Bronx South, fifty eight point eighty six percent went to the district. Uh, for Manhattan North, um, in who sets these percentages? The district. W with they no set input their from budget. Their yeah, so they would meet with the membership and um, develop a district budget, and sign off on it and submit it to, to NYCHA and that's what we use to fund the district budgets. Manhattan North was 26.8%. So, but in, in, in an I, in our, it would seem to me in a rational universe, right, the dollar amount that you receive in TPA funding should depend on the need, on the size of your development. It seems to me that there could have been developments that were receiving less funding than they should have been receiving and developments that were receiving more funding. Right. That's a crazy So system. this is, this yeah, is yeah. why we needed to reform the process. <laughs> so, so now what's the, 
now you can opt into the district. Yes. And what's going to be the percentage? 20%. And that's going to be a uniform yes. percentage. Okay. Um, I have one, one final set of questions regarding the administrative overhead. I know we've pressed you on this, but so the 10 staffers are exclusively responsible for the administration of TP fund, TPA funds. Can you, can you describe to me in detail what is their role? What do they do, actually? Because it seems to me like the administration of TPA funds seems like a straightforward process. Maybe, I'm, maybe I don't appreciate the complexity of it, mm -hmm. but what exactly are they doing? So they're receiving the proposals from the resident associations okay. and working through the eligibility of the proposals eligible for TPA funds. Um, and each proposal has a number of components, so they may be processing invoices or purchase orders. Each proposal may have 20 different components to it, up to for a proposal. But now with yep. the commercial cards, they won't have to do that work. Well, with the commercial cards, so with the commercial cards, they are still proposals, but we're receive them. We receiving them on a quarterly basis. So rather um, than rather than proposal by proposal. So that, and well, we're still approving. That's a lot them. less work. It's not because no? we're no, it's not. We're still <laughs> approving them for eligibility. The part that doesn't go associated with the commercial card is we're not making the small purchases. They're actually making the purchases directly. But there's still an approval process. There's still a reconciliation No, I understand. There's, there is some process. We agree. Yeah. Right? The question mm -hmm. is, what is the rigor of that process? And under the old process, you would micromanage every purchase. Mm -hmm. right. Under the new process, you're reviewing purchases on a quarterly basis. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And one requires fewer but employees than the other. The purchases are still reconciled on a daily basis. So if a resident association is approved to make purchases right. and they go out and purchase today, right. they have a certain amount of time to upload their receipts. We're looking at that. We see when purchases are made against each card, and we're monitoring it, checks and balances. So I would just also add that, you know, we are in the midst of a reform process, right? So we had a centralized TPA unit of 10 individuals who manage a proposal-by-proposal proposal submission process. We have also started a commercial card pilot, which right now has only 33 resident associations in the commercial card. So the commercial card process will significantly reduce the amount of back office administrative work and make it more resident facing. <coughs> so right now we're managing two processes. We would, our goal is to bring resident associations into the commercial card process. And what that would do is essentially allow us to we would essentially reduce the number of folks who are in our central TPA unit, and they would be yeah. redeployed to these frontline roles, um, and we would actually fall better within what is the admin fee. Right now, we are spending over what is the admin fee. Yeah, I would just, I, I think we're going to have a disagreement, but I have to recess the hearing in a few minutes. But I, I wish there were a strategy for how do we reduce, how do we minimize administrative overhead so that we're freeing up dollars for actual programming and services that promote resident engagement. And I hope that we develop a strategy for those unspent TPA funds. I mean, to see those dollars languish indefinitely is scandalous, in my opinion, given the lack of resources in public housing. And then I heard early, I think you did commit to immediately making available online the allocation per, per development. Is that a commitment that NYCHA is going sure, to honor? We can make that available. Okay. Yeah. W w immediately online? Is that something that can be done? Sure. It's okay. Absolutely. We can make that online. I think right. that it's... It's not only to the benefit of resident associations, but also residents to know what the allocation is and how it's being used at their development. So we'll, we can Great. make that available. With that said, um, we need to take a 15-minute recess because the Environmental Protection Committee needs this committee room for a vote, right? Is that? So we are in recess. Thank you.